listening to the bomb hole. Bomb hole podcast. It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. <laughs> the bomb hole. We're going to slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On a big, nice, burgundy snowboard. All right. Here we go again with another episode of the bomb hole podcast presented by Pub Beer. Now, first things first, got to ask, Stony Buds, how are you doing today? So good, my dog. Solid, solid. Nine out of ten. Nine out of ten. Uh, To my left, we got Nick Russell in the booth. Nick, how are you doing today? Honored to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, we're happy that you're here. For our listeners that don't know who you are, Nick, I'm going to do a little brief description. Uh, Nick is a professional snowboarder that split boards for a living. We're talking bagging giant peaks like Denali, and he's all about human-powered snowboarding. Instead of using a snowmobile or a helicopter to get to the top of these peaks, he hikes the top. He's got a bunch of first descents. He's a Protect Our Winners activist. He has a long list of notable movie projects he's been in, from Warren Miller to TGR to Danny Davis's new project, Ark, which I watched this part. It's kind of a, it's kind of a heat maker. Uh, so we're going to get into all of it. But we're going to start this thing off today with a guest question from the one they call the froth puppy, none other than... Double A, same way, Alexander's. Here we go. Yo, bomb haulers. Froth Pup here. Stoked you got Nick on. Yo, Nick. Why do you walk in the mountains instead of using other modes of transportation? I know your passion runs deep for human power to sense. And I'm hoping you can give the listeners a little bit more of an inside scoop to why you've chosen this path in snowboarding and what it means to you to climb these mountains and surf the earth. Later. Alpine Andrews. Hard-hitting question right out of the gate from Alex. Is that his new nickname, yeah. Alpine? That's what I was calling him when we got out last year. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> the, al- the Alpinist. Yeah. The Alpinist. Ooh, that's a really Ooh. good yeah. one. Al- First of all, it sounds like we're going to need some granola for this episode. Yeah, huh? it is. Did, yeah. did anyone bring any? <laughs> I, I got a couple. We'll get some at I break, got, maybe. He, well, he keeps them in each pocket. He's <laughs> oh, got a couple okay. fistfuls. He's got enough for yeah. everybody, huh? Yeah. You got your pole back there? That... Yeah. <laughs> I got some poles. We're going to be point pointing at things. and I got some maps and like some carabiners. This should be a great episode. It's going to be great. I, mean, I love it. I love the like low key shit talking on it because I can tell that secretly you're getting into it, like you know low key in there. Um, but yeah, psyched to be here. Big fan of the show, so thank you. Uh, as per Alex's question, you know, it was never really a um, you know intentional choice to to be a splitboard guy. It sort of started by necessity. Uh, when I, you know, kind of started getting into the backcountry, the typical path, if you wanted to film, was that you needed a helicopter or you needed a snowmobile. And I didn't have money for either. You know, I didn't really have any sponsors that were helping me out. So neither of those were in the cards. And so, you know, it first kind of started bootpacking around Grizzly Gulch and shit like that off the resort. And... Then I picked up a split board and sort of realized I could get fresh snow every single day, and it was free. Um, and and as I started to get older, I, I kind of embraced and like sort of set down this path of dirt bagging where I was trying to be as frugal as possible because I didn't want to work in the wintertime. So I was like, okay, what expenses in my life can I cut out? And one of those just happened to be a ski resort pass And, you know, with split boarding, I realized that I was snowboarding more than ever without riding a chairlift. And eventually that kind of just became my go-to method of transportation in the mountains. And definitely over the years, you know, that has evolved where you start to fall in love with this process of, you know, ascending the mountain under your own power and the full experience of it all and, and being in the mountains for like a really extended period of time. And it gives you a different experience in the mountains. I think that uh, with all aspects of snowboarding, they, they're they all based upon like location, access, and the type of experience that you want to have out there. And, you know, where I live in Tahoe, we have a lot of wilderness areas. So snowmobiles are not even allowed in these areas, Uh, like wilderness, national parks, all these places that happen to have the best terrain in the country. And so it's not even an option to take a sled to these spots. So you have to split board. And 
you know, like you don't even think about it at, like, at a certain point of like, oh, we got to walk up there. You know, it's just all part of the process. And, you know, you just love the whole thing. Very eloquently yeah, answered, right nice. out of the gate. Well, cool. We're going to talk all about uh, split boarding and all the first descents and all the granola you've eaten and all those types of things. But uh, let's maybe run it back to, you know, your roots as a competitive freestyle snowboarder or how you got into it. Grew up on the East Coast, Connecticut, then moved to Southern Vermont, Stratton specifically first Bromley and then Stratton Oof, we gotta get nice. Bro- let's get Bromley, Bromley in air horn. I don't think that's come up wow. on the show yet yeah big Ooh. Brom that's exciting yeah um yeah Bromley was so sick dude they had the t-bar right at the half pipe the half pipe was only like eight feet tall you know you probably remember it back then oh yeah and Ross Powers was actually from Bromley before he went to Stratton and at that time, the dudes that I looked up to that were, you know, a couple of years older, it was uh, Tyler Eamon, Nate Farrell, Greg Bokenkamp. Um, Heavy there, hitters. There was a solid crew that I would follow around, like Little Grom um, and my back hill kit. And, you know, the those guys started to uh, migrate towards Stratton. Stratton was home with the U.S. Open and... Through like late 90s, 2000s, you know, when the Open was there, that was Mecca. That was everything, dude, the center of the snowboarding universe. And no matter where you are growing up snowboarding, you're a product of your environment. And so like half pipe riding specifically was most prevalent at that time. And, you know, it would always be like come March, you know, you're getting ready for the U.S. Open Junior Jam and we're hiking the half pipe and doing the deal and, you know, trying to poach the half pipe later on and then eventually start competing in the main event uh, through through the qualifying series. It used to be an open event, so it would be like whole deal, pre-qualifiers, qualifiers, quarterfinals, semifinals, finals. And so it's this whole week-long event that, you know, as a little kid, you're just going to the swag booth, there's swag booths and you're getting stickers, you're getting dues, you're getting, you know, all kinds of shit. And uh, I remember me and my brother, it was 2000 US Open. Uh, the event, the finals ended, we were watching from the sidelines. And that's kind of when people start dropping into the half by right after the last rider drops. And also getting the banners used to be a really big thing. And me and my brother, we get in there, we get this huge banner off. It's like five times the size of me. I was, you know, super. What brand are you grabbing? U.S. Open 2000. Oh, the actual. Yeah, US yeah, Open yeah. Sick. yeah. Yeah, big yellow banner. And we totally get this thing and we're sliding down the deck of the half pipe, like sledding on this thing. And, the, you know, back then when it was party dudes, just hammered drunk. And so they're trying to like push me off. You know, I'm like 12, 12 year old kid, 11 years old. I don't even know. And, uh, we get out of there, like, hanging on to this banner for dear life, and we still got it. That's pretty cool. Respect. You still yeah. have it now to this day? Still have it, Ooh. yeah. And that's, that's like, that's it a, deserves to be in a museum. Yeah. For it, sure. We got to get like it on the wall here. a piece of culture right there. Yeah. And we, a uh, little fun fact, Nick and I were in the Green Mountain series together. We used to battle that's it out. so sick. Who, would, uh, who we, was winning? I think you were, like, an age group higher. Uh, yeah. Um, or just, like, the next one up. But I got this, this funny memory at a slope style contest at Stratton, I think, that uh, that park that was on the left side, the Burn, Trisha Burns Park, mm-hmm. that tabletop. Mm-hmm. Chris drops in, and back then I remember, you know, he was already seasoned and riding with no gloves, and, and oh, one, of the, one of the coaches at the top just, like, has this offhand remark, like, 50 bucks for Nate the Weed could get you a pair of gloves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dude, back in that day, it's so sick. You guys are, even in my day, and... And uh, but not anymore. You get those half pipe skills as a kid. It's crazy. Nowadays, I wonder if kids are getting those skills. You know, because now they're just all jibbing the rails in the park. They're not getting that half pipe foundation. Right. It was. I mean, even back then, it was kind of rare. Like, you know, more common for East Coast riders to have somewhat of half pipe skills compared to the dudes in the West, True, like a yeah. mammoth or whatever. Even though they had a sick half pipe, it just wasn't as popular because they had sick jumps. And yeah. You know, and that's where the term pipe jock 
came from, yeah, you know, it just like had this connotation to it that it just was like a bit more of a, like a sport. But hiking pipe is, is so fun. And, and back Heck then, yeah. I mean, the people that were in Green Mountain Series in our little era, I mean, we had Michael Goldschmidt, Louis Vito, uh, the, the Matronis. Matronis, KP. Yeah, KP. Uh, dude, you know who, like my two favorite riders back then so we would you know do the half pipe circuit primarily and then there'd be like other crews of riders i feel like you guys kind of got into your own with filming a little bit earlier on and sort of phased out of that thing and you know because of the people that i was rolling with i i stuck with it and, and tried to make it happen for a little bit longer but uh you know there's a crew like the dudes that were riding at okimo Alex Sorokin and Cody Rosenthal. Two air horns for them. <laughs> Maybe super air horn? Yeah. Sorokin is like the un, unsung hero of East Coast snowboarding. Yeah, no doubt. He was so sick. And probably still is. If he still shreds, I don't know. If you're out there, Alex, we love you. <laughs> we love you. We're not worthy. <laughs> I feel like pipe might start making a resurgence, though. People, well, there, everyone's there talking is no about fucking it. half pipes. Little little 22s. Pipes, I've, I've heard people talking about making little pipe more. They're coming out more at resorts. Dude, I went to Mammoth, a Mammoth North Star one. this last year. Yeah, Mammoth has a good one, 18 footer. North Star had a good 18 footer that I got a couple laps in last year, and it is so fun. 18's yeah. money. But, dude, the 22 footer is just so it's scary. Just too much for yeah, people. Yeah, dude, you feel like an astronaut in one of those flight simulators when you're dropping real. in, dude. Like, your cheeks are... <laughs> <laughs> like, and you, if you're really oh going to catch the air, you got to go so fast and not oh, turn, yeah. like Ferg was telling us the other day. Yeah, you'll be going so fast and then just hit the lip. Yeah, it's crazy. It's funny, like, without really riding too much hard pack, park, pipe anymore the last 10, however many years... Uh, like if you don't use it, you lose it. That's true. You know, it's the truth wow. fully. And so I like, I wish that I had somewhat kept my <laughs> skills a little sharpened. <laughs> um, and so now every time I do, I get my like annual half pipe run in and it, it just gets scarier and scarier. And, uh, I, I feel like I should do it a little bit more because like inner deep down, you think that you can still do these things, especially when I go riding with people like Danny and whatnot. And, uh, yeah, he's held on to it all. Totally. Dude, drop it into an Olympic regulation pipe, might as well be a first ascent. Well, those things are mm. so perfect, Thanks though. You. The actual <laughs> contest pipes, yeah, are, are like, so incredibly perfect. But I got to go back to the, um, if you don't use it, you lose it. Mm. Also, a great quote from 40-Year-Old Virgin. Uh, he's actually <laughs> asking in sex ed. He's like, is it true that if you don't use it, you lose it? And she goes, is that a real question? He goes, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what did it look like uh, from, you know, Moving off the East Coast, moving out West, pursuing the career in freestyle snowboarding. Where did it go from here? I went straight out here to Salt Lake. Right after high school, I moved out here and uh, started riding at Brighton. And that is where kind of everything sort of shifted for me. First time I had really ridden real powder and ridden off-piste, you know, riding up crest. And uh, what is that, Pioneer? Yep. bowl up there like that was the first open pitch of powder that i ever rode and i remember it like it was yesterday i've i've talked about it and in, in a couple other things but like i remember hiking up there and dropping in and like leaning into this toe side turn and like your body's kind of perpendicular to the slope you can like put your back hand down and it's just like dragging right and that is floating right there and i remember looking back up at the track like post kind of apex of the turn just like kind of in shock and sort of in this in this uh like floating state of bliss right i'm like what was that like i want to keep doing that and my friend mary was with me and you know i clearly had like a fun little line and she was like you should do this like you should do some some big mountain Jeremy Jones snowboarding. And I remember her saying that those lines and I'm like, I don't even know what that means. And so it's funny to see how it's, it's evolved through there, but you know, riding, riding a place like Brighton or Snowbird, you're mashing the full mountain and you're not even thinking about going into the park or anything like that. 
and you get those legs strong and, you know, you have that foundation of edge control and, you know, eventually, you know, the tracks start building up on a powder day. And so you're kind of going outside the resort boundaries a little bit more, a little bit more. You discover Grizzly Gulch is right up the road and, you know, maybe there's some old jumps there that, you know, that there's remnants of that you're dusting off and whatever and, and playing around. And we didn't really know what we were doing at all. Like we were definitely super cowboy in the beginning, you know, no Avi gear or anything like that, just idiots. And uh, it eventually just started getting more and more and more. And, you know, the Absinthe movies were coming out at that time and, like Nicholas Mueller, geeky parts, riding natural terrain was really like the most ex- exciting, cool looking style of snowboarding that I liked. So that's kind of what we try to imitate. And through that process, you know, we were trying to film and shoot photos. And so learning, you know, that whole side of snowboarding, which is another beast and talent. And, uh, you know, it, it was just sort of a snowball effect from there. All right, we're going to take a quick break and talk to you about Union Bindings. That's what Stony Buds runs. That is what I run. That's what you run, too, huh? Yep. The split board. We're on split board mode in this podcast, so I'm going to talk about the Explorer Binding. You catch me out there, I'm just, I got carabiners and ropes and fistfuls of granola, <laughs> and I got the Explorer Split Board Binding, and we are pointing out all the peaks in the mountain. And those bindings, man, technical piece of ma- mastery right there. They're the best for going down the hill as well as up the hill. And uh, I'd have to say best binding out there, huh, Chris? Check out Union's website if you're interested in getting some bindings. I believe it's unionbindingco.com. Um, we're back, and I have to ask, what got you into split boarding? I mean, it's easy just to hike around and throw on some snowshoes and all that, put on your verts, but what got you to actually get on a split board? Yeah, around that time was when Deeper first came out, Jeremy Jones's first movie, and I remember going to the premiere and uh, just being blown away of, of what I just saw and kind of was drawn to that instantly. But you sort of need someone to get you into that, right? Like, even if you just go out and buy the gear, like, you don't know where to go and what to do and how to set a skin track and all that. So, like mentorship is a very important thing in this aspect of snowboarding and you know at first the the first two people that really helped me out were neil and ian provo Mm. who had already been doing this they they had been splitting their boards for a couple years and uh i remember i split my first board it might have been with them but zach siebert helped me split it and I think it was Scotty Arnold's garage. Wow. And um, so it kind of started chasing those guys around and eventually met Forrest Shear, who kind of OG of the Wasatch and really great friend of mine. And he helped me out a lot. And so, like, definitely those two guys, Neil and, and Forrest from the start, were, you know, big influences to me, still are. And, um, played a big role in kind of my development and in, in getting into the mountains this way. And you guys are splitting your own boards. Yeah. Cause you weren't like me just going out there and trying to get one and uh, get it set up. It's to have someone help me set it up and all that. You were splitting the board yourself. Yeah, totally. Um, which I, I think like a lot of the, the older guys in split boarding are like, Oh dude, I've been doing that for fucking 30 years. Yeah. I like get used to it. But, uh, but yeah, I was riding for Rosignol at the time, and they didn't have a factory-made split board. I think this was like 2010 or so, around then, 2009. And uh, yeah, you just cut it right down the middle. There used to be this guy in Ogden, spacing on his name, but he would inlay an edge on the inside edge, which, you know, when you're skinning on firm snow, whatever, is pretty crucial. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, they're way looser because you got to T-bolt them and all that and and then at that time too there wasn't really uh like split board bindings that would just slide right on um so you'd be on the volley pucks and so your bindings are like you know half inch above the board and definitely felt like a split board and so i think in those that time you know people would kind of talk shit be like oh the boards ride like shit and, and now, you know, the factory-made boards are super money, and you can take it on the resort and not really tell the difference. 
Uh, so, but like originally, they would be pretty loose. Now every company has them. It's, every it's crazy how far it's come, huh? Yeah, and all of that is thanks to Jeremy and his trilogy, Deeper, Further, Higher. That's what showed the world, like the masses of snowboarding, like the the ease of split, not the ease of splitboarding, but just like that anyone can do it. And that's, you know, what gave me a lot of inspo before I started hanging with Jeremy. He was a huge mentor of mine well before I ever met him. Uh, you know, we'd be dissecting those movies and just the in-betweens and those films would show the process of everything and kind of make it this tangible dream that, you know, you realize if you get the right gear, if you have the knowledge of the mountains, if you have the, you know, the avalanche safety skills and you have the right crew that you can go out and do this, you can go and fill up a heavy backpack, put a tent in there and go beyond the ridge right there that, that you've always looked at and go camp out for a couple of nights. It's not that hard, you know? So like those movies for sure were a huge catalyst for me. Um, I got a Patreon question for you because yeah. I think a big topic is safety mm -hmm. and uh, it's almost a problem. Anybody can, your, your mom could buy you a split board for Christmas and all of a sudden this kid has a license to the back country and maybe no experience. So I think talking about risk maturity is something we'll be getting into. But Eric Hoffman asks, can you describe your relationship with risk now that you're going to larger ranges of the world? How do you know when you're in over your head? You always feel like you're in over your head in those big mountains, man. Like, I feel like if you don't, that's when you're going to get yourself into trouble. But to your earlier statement, you know, I feel like that a uh, safety kit Beacon Shovel Probe should be uh, a prerequisite to, to buying a split board or, or a, a ski touring setup for sure. I heard there was something with, uh, you know, the boom in the backcountry with COVID over the last however many years that their, you know, major spike in ski tour and backcountry split board setups, but the, the safety gear did not have the direct correlation to that, which says a lot, you know. Um, but man, in the in the big mountains, it's um, it's a very slow process, dude. Like you get into the the greater ranges in Alaska and, and all around, and and you feel pretty damn small. And having the time to really absorb your environment is crucial, you know. Uh, you know, kind of noticing trends in the weather. It's, seeing what faces avalanche after it snows, making sure that you're far away from them. Um, and, you know, having as big a safety net for like that slim margin of error is crucial. And after this last trip to Nepal, you know, I've been thinking about that a lot with, with risk management and risk tolerance and, and all of that. And, you know, it is part of the whole thing you know, there is that inherent danger of going in the mountains, whether you're in Alaska or you're here on Grizzly Gulch. You know, there is an inherent danger into going in the backcountry. It is not controlled. It is not a safe place. And so all of our training over the years that we do every year, refreshers, you know, it's all about, you know, how do you go into dangerous places and do it safely? I feel like I'm a pretty conservative snowboarder um you know there is a time and place where you can open it up and get a film worthy line but that might only happen once or you know a couple times a year if you're lucky like sometimes it doesn't even happen at all and like i think it's easy for a lot of people to you know see a peak and mind surf and whatever and be like ah oh, you know point it bomb it off that cliff and whatever but you realize like when you're on foot you know, that safety net is like non-existent. It's you and your crew that you have to rely on. And, <clears throat> excuse me, seemingly, you know, small injury can be a really big deal out there if you're a ridgeback where snowmobiles can't get, if it's storming, if you're in the trees, you know, you blow out a knee, you break a leg, whatever may not seem light, life threatening, but, you know, you're out there. And if you've ever tried to, to pull anybody out of the mountains, you're not getting very far. So 
I think having that that kind of grim reaper in mind um, and keeping it conservative and like knowing when the days to send it are and knowing when to back off and take it easy a little bit. Now, there's uh, there's something I want to talk about too in those heavy situations. I was speaking with uh, Jeremy about this yesterday, and he, you know, was saying that you're, you know, you're a funny dude. You keep it lighthearted in the backcountry. You're never too stressed, never too uh, uptight, I guess. And I feel like in those really high stress situations, the high risk situations, the no fall zones, mm-hmm. uh, how crucial is humor and keeping it? keeping it light and keeping it funny in those in those heavy situations. It's essential, dude. You don't want to be out in the mountains and feel stressed out by pressure to do something or you don't want your homie to be in a bad mood and just kind of cast a shadow over the whole day. Like I think we all probably have friends that get in bad moods and, you know, can be grumpy and whatnot. And I definitely try to, you know, Rub their shoulders. Like, Come on, man. Like, snap <laughs> out of it, dude. Like, Loosen look, them up a little. Yeah, totally. Look around. Like, look where we are. How lucky are we? Like, we don't have to be here right now. We are willingly choosing to be here. And I want to have the most fun I can have. Like, yeah, a lot of times you're you're doing trying to do a job, you know, whether whether you're shooting or filming, and it can be work at times. But yeah, you, we're out there to have a good time and like no one's forcing you to be there. So, you know crack a couple jokes and keep a smile on your face because like man we set our lives up to be able to do this like we're out here 10 a.m on a tuesday most people are in the office right now like this is a blessing we need to take advantage of that and i think you know choosing your mountain partners is a really important thing uh, about that you want to be in the mountains with with people that you know not only you trust in their their skills but people that you're going to have a good time with and there's definitely people that are more high stress, uh, especially in like shooting situations. And I just kind of choose not to really go out with those people as much. Um, I think when you're when you're younger, you, <laughs> you got any names for it? Just kidding. <laughs> oh, I got Bob, Steve, all the douchebags. Yeah. Here's a list of my top five douchebags. Yeah, yeah, you got the blacklist. Um, but yeah, like. Your your riding partners are your friends. They're going to help you have a good time, and then they're also going to be your lifeline. So, like, having faith in their abilities um, in a rescue situation is crucial. So, you know, keeping that crew small, I feel like, is really important. When you get too many people out there, it's kind of a shit show. Too many cooks in the kitchen scenario, and everyone sort of has their own agenda. Um and yeah, you just like need to have these people's backs, you know, it's like your brothers and sisters. And, you know, I know when I go out in the mountains with people, I'm like, I got your back. Like something goes down, we're going to get you out of here and we're going to make it. And uh, yeah, I can't really emphasize that point enough. Like choose your partners wisely. You mentioned how like a small injury can be just crazy. Totally. Out there. Um, I was with Forrest when he broke his femur, but we were snowmobiling. Mm. I can't imagine what it would be like if you were deep in out there on skins or on, on split boards. Yeah. That would be insane. My first encounter with a rescue situation was Mount Baker. We were filming for the first Given movie and Wyatt Stasinos got in an avalanche. And Heavy one. Super heavy. First avalanche I'd ever really seen. You know, I was super green. It was my first year filming, first year completely in the backcountry. And we were out on snowmobiles out at uh, Glacier Creek there near Mount Baker. And that was, you know, definitely a, a spark to myself furthering my education in the mountains. Um, but yeah, he can you know, he got caught in an avalanche, got run through some trees, unconscious when we got to him. It was blue. We thought we were losing him. Like we saw him leaving. You was know? he under? He his hand was out. He was wrapped around a tree. Okay. Um, but the, just 
you know, the whole situation was crazy. And the only reason it has a happy ending is because of the crew that we were with. Uh, super OG Baker crew, Nate, Lynn, Tark, uh, Pat Lee, uh, and then Jeff Hambone came in to help with the rescue. But, you know, we're all at the bottom and he's riding this line. I think it was called the skinny, essentially uh, just this hallway through the trees. We'd been riding all morning and ignoring the red flags. You know, it's kind of the like cardinal rule. You're like, uh, just so in the moment having fun that you're missing out on all these obvious signs. It was starting to snow a lot more. It was getting windy, seeing cracks. And Pat, Pat Lee, no, Nate Lind rode the line first. So that's another thing. Um, I can't remember what you, what the, uh, what the terminology is, but yeah. So you see a track, you know, and you're like, oh, it's good. And you can hear in the clip, it's in the movie, you know, he's like, oh, it was so fun, you know, from the bottom. We're all at the bottom watching. Wyatt drops in, cracks it off, and, you know, gets carried and, and, and disappears. And in that moment, you're waiting for your friend to come over the radio or to hear a yell, all good. You know, like, did you pull out right? Did you pull out right? Like, hoping that he made it out right, and he didn't. And we had all hopped on the snowmobiles. I had been doubled out there. I didn't really even know how to snowmobile grab a board, we go up there, and those guys came in from the top. I had grabbed someone else's board, I think Nate Lynn's board, and give it to him. And I was shook, man. Like, and then I go down on the sled halfway and, and walk into the slope from halfway, and I remember I'm walking in cement. You know, when you're, when you're walking through that shit, it's slow motion. It's like those dreams where you're trying to punch and you just can't do it. And yeah, so we get to him and he comes back too. And we had to, you know, strap him to his board where his, you know, essentially his binding was ripped off his board. So we were able to use that as a sled. And I remember we're pulling him down, like six of us through full war field, broken trees, huge debris piles. And it was gnarly to get to the bottom of this slope. And someone had left to go get help. There was no cell service or anything. Someone left to go get help. It's like 13 miles out there. And we get back to the road. Homie goes to, uh, what is it, Chair 9 Pizza, whatever that pizza shop is right there. Just happens to run in there. Jeff Hambone, who deserves an air horn. Um, I think he runs the Abbey Center there. Super boss. He comes out to basically help. We splint his leg up, you know, using camera tripod, uh, belts, boot laces, whatever we had. We were not prepared for it. We didn't have a proper first aid kit. You know, we didn't have a satellite phone. And we split him up and hunkered down, put him in a, in a uh, kind of heat, heat blanket. And the call to search and rescue had gone out. We hear the heli come in. It's behind the trees, and you can hear the heli. You can see the snow moving off the trees. But it started storming so hard that it couldn't land. And I remember when it flew away, it was, like, so deflating. Just, you know, full heartbreak. It went from, like, oh, everything's good. He's We got him to, like, oh, fuck, we've been here now for five hours. It's getting dark. He's getting hypothermic. This is getting serious. And we were too scared to move him because we didn't know if it was a compound fracture in his leg. And eventually, you know, Wyatt's a very resilient dude. You know, he has, he's not going to tell you when he's hurting. And eventually he's just kind of like, we got to get out of here. Like, you know, he, you could tell he was fucked up. And so we ended up strapping him to the snowmobile, his head on the gas can. And I can't remember who drove him out, probably Hambone kind of just, you know, standing up, standing over him like this. And as we're going out, we encountered, like, the search and rescue team that was coming out finally, however many hours later. And at that point, he was all packaged up and, and good for transport, so we just kept going. And that was a huge wake-up call to me. We had been, you know, trying to play in these mountains and not giving them the full respect. 
I don't even, I think I had maybe taken like an avalanche clinic or something before that, but like that, you know, a couple of days later we did a proper course. Like we had the whole crew. Um, I was going to visit Wyatt like every day in the hospital in Seattle. He had a broken femur, broken hip, broken elbow. And I, I was shook. I didn't want to go back out in the mountains after that. And I remember going to visit Wyatt and he like looks at me and it's raining in Seattle and Wyatt has this sixth sense. You know, he's a very in tune human. So he knows that it's snowing still up at the mountain. He's like, what are you doing here? It's powder day up there, dude. Like you gotta get back out there. And you know, I have tears in my eyes and like seeing my friend like, who just almost died and he's telling me that I have to get back out in the mountains. So that meant a lot to me, but I, you know, kind of took that situation where it's like, if this is what I want to do, if this is the style of snowboarding that I want to pursue, I have to learn as much as I can about mountain safety, avalanche rescues, because I need to have my friends back. I can't be second guessing my skills when something like this goes down and, you know, from there on out, it was like every year we're doing a refresher. We're kind of taking the next steps. Avi 1, Avi 2, wilderness first responder, wilderness first aid, all that. And it's like more of an exclamation point. We're like, if we're doing this on foot, you have to be completely self-reliant out there. You know, it is you guys. You have to be so self-sufficient and be able to handle whatever kind of situations come your way. So that was like, you know, my first experience with it all and, and kind of set the tone for the next 10 plus years. Yeah, what a wake-up call uh, that must have been. That's powerful crazy. story for yeah. sure. And, and going back, just a quick one for our listeners and our audience. I think it's super important. I'd love to have you run through quick uh quickly kind of your items in your pack you mentioned you had like no sat phone none of these things what are your like non-negotiable split board pack like what do you have in that on a day-to-day basis um you know you have the obvious beacon shovel probe which are useless unless you know how to use them properly and you've practiced many times uh you know it's kind of easier said and said than done but like a beacon search is super fucking easy. You know, you follow the arrows and the numbers go down. It's super simple. So that should not be any sort of concern in that, you know, Um, which just comes from practice, 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 where it's like so ingrained in the back of your head. Um, But so, yeah, aside from the obvious, radios are super helpful within the crew. Uh, Generally, if you're filming, you have those, but even like if you're just out free riding, they're super helpful. Uh, like a Garmin inReach, um, not not a satellite phone, but like a texting satellite device, so you can text from wherever. Um, extra layer, uh, you know, a, a refined first aid kit. You know, it's not just like going to REI and buying a stock first aid kit. You know, put put the items in there that that you know that you're gonna need. Um, maybe like having some pain pills in there is great. Um, but yeah, th- I'd say those are kind of the essentials. Oh, and a headlamp is definitely really important because you're in the main winter months. It gets dark quickly, dude. It's like, you know, early season up until February, it's getting dark at 5, 6 p.m. And it's it's easy to get stuck out in the dark for sure. And you got to keep that in mind too um, when you're riding. Like generally we'll try to do our most serious riding in the morning. So like east facing lines northeast facing lines so like <clears throat> if something does go down you have the whole day to deal but if you're trying to ride something at sunset light um that's can be a lot more consequential if something goes wrong so like when you're kind of getting into the gnar uh you know you take that with some caution and everything needs to be perfect for that to line up yeah, this is like a master class for master backcountry class. awareness. I wanted to add a couple items that I keep in mind that's been super helpful that has saved me. And and this is a lot of times, in, in maybe if you're snowmobiling too, but uh, paracord has been huge for yeah. me. Some carabiners, some volet straps, 
Uh, I keep super glue in mind because like it's mm-hmm. an easy way to seal up a wound. Mm. Um, <clears throat> those are some other items off the top of my head. But yeah, Chris got us some uh, for what two Christmases ago. Oh yeah, he got everybody a uh, a little first aid kit made, that, that he customized. Yeah, I made oh, cool. custom Refined. first aid kits for everybody that works at the bomb hole. To keep Dude, in their pack. I've been thinking about putting uh, like a smelling salt. Oh, oh yeah, nice. in That's the kit would be a pretty be good, good move. Yeah. And yeah. then you might drop in and back ten the finger instead Woo. of just doing a straight air off of it. You know, you might be fired up. Wake totally. somebody up if <laughs> need be. Like the adrenaline shot at uh, <laughs> was that movie with like Jonah Hill and Puff <laughs> Daddy? <laughs> Get him to the Greek. Get him to the Greek. Yeah, yeah. The Greek. <laughs> I remember the first time I ever went helling helling. It was uh, when you're a new guy to the crew. They make you do that beacon search every mm-hmm. morning. Do you, if you had a new guy you never worked with, would you ever do that if you were just going out to the back country and someone was coming with you? Maybe if it wasn't even work, it was just like you're going out to the back country. Because I'm yeah. sure you, everyone yeah, sure. you bring for work, you trust, but. Yeah, you're always, you're always doing a beacon check uh, in the morning and, you know, maybe, you know, you're like, hey, Gary, you're doing the beacon check today. Yeah. Um, not necessarily. Gary's like, always doing the Gary check. Gary needs to do the check and Gary every gets the time. short end of the stick, <laughs> dude. Uh, but no, I like what you said about paracord and carabiners because that is, uh, you know, a pretty important thing if you need to pull somebody out. But like I said, if you've ever tried to do that, like make a sled and pull somebody out, it is fucking hard, man. Like to get someone, you know, a hundred feet is is a really big effort. So to think that you're going to get somebody up and over a mountain is not really realistic. So you need to have these safety plans in place uh who are you gonna call ghostbusters, ghostbusters. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah who are you gonna call like what are the uh you know the direct lines to the search and rescue and where you live and in what range that you're in is kind of an important thing to know and usually 911 is the best thing but you know you can have that direct line to sar and uh and also having an idea of like where are these helis coming from if if you're going to need a helicopter rescue cuz more often than not you know it's going to take a couple hours at least if they can even get in there mm-hmm. so you know just keeping that those things in mind when when you're trying to step up into bigger terrain um, I, I wanted to add one other thing too i think there's a humongous statistic of search and rescue of people getting essentially lost right of not knowing where they are too like um in the mountains at least maybe via snowmobile and things like that. And, and especially when the storm comes in and it's gray bird and you don't have many reference points. So, um, what about the importance of like GPS or maps or knowing like your location? It's huge. Um, I, you know, when I'm in the bigger mountains, usually carrying a paper map. Um, but there are amazing GPS apps. Onyx Backcountry is my favorite. Uh, you know, I think that's getting more and more popular to kind of map out your route and things like that. But to your point with, you know, sleds and people kind of just getting lost, like you can get yourself into a lot of trouble with a snowmobile. And uh, that's part of the reason why I love splitboarding so much is (coughs) because you are self-reliant. You are not uh, at the mercy of a machine that breaks down. I think it's like kind of fucking crazy that, sleds go out like however many miles deep in the back country and you don't have a split board the thing about your split board is like you can go anywhere with that thing it's a, such an amazing tool of moving through the mountains it's so efficient that like you can literally go anywhere but with like a snow machine that thing breaks down and you don't have a fucking split board like think about post holing 10 miles yeah right dude like <laughs> So, so I, I keep that shit in mind. I even think that, too, like about helicopters. Like, oh, what are the hell he breaks down and we're out here? We're fucked. Yeah, there's no you getting know? out of that one. Yeah. That's crazy, your story about how the helicopter came and had to take away. And like, we couldn't leave. see it, That's too, nuts. which was the crazy thing. Oh, you couldn't even see it? No, it was like behind us. Yeah, we just heard it behind this tree band. And, you know, you like have this feeling like, ah, the cavalry's here. Everything's all good. Yeah, everything's yeah. going to be great. Nope. And then they leave. All right, we're going to take a quick break and talk to you guys about hippies. It's a great snack if you're in the backcountry or you're at your office job, 9 to 5, buds. Yes, the uh, chickpea tortilla mixture, delicious. This is a, one of my favorite new snacks right now. I've been putting them down in between podcasts when I'm doing office work. It's great. They're gluten-free, vegan, 
and non-GMO. So if you're looking for a healthy alternative that tastes just as good as a freaking Dorito, it's not like uh, eating cardboard like some of these healthy snacks. They're bomb. So check out uh, hippies.com and use promo code BOMBHOLE20 for 20% off. Again, hippies.com, promo code BOMBHOLE20 for 20% off. All right, let's take a second and talk about Volcom. Um, let's get into the fit. I think our guest just left to take a fit, and uh, let's get into it. Have you ever taken a backcountry fit? I actually haven't. Wow. I do that technique where you kind of hold the snowmobile and, and go back. What's what's your move out there? Uh, actually, I put a glove on the running board of the snowmobile to take a backcountry fit. <laughs> oh, really? For, <laughs> wow. Pro tip. You try lean against out. it. Fitting in the backcountry. Let's go. Hey, Bommel, this is Brian and Gucci. Let's talk some fit. My signature collection consists of a Gore-Tex jacket, pant, and a vest. It's within the GPT category, so it's a high-end, high-performance, the highest-end high-performance gear you can get through Volcom. The pant and jacket are made from a stretched, breathable fabric. The fit, it's baggy, but not too baggy. You know, what's really important to me is being able to hike, and if you're boot packing up something steep, you really want to lift your legs with ease. And having the lightweight, breathable, flexible fabric really does allow you to move freely in the mountains. And you know, when you're putting in big, long days, it really makes a difference. Rain, sleet, hail, Wyoming winters aren't friendly, but with the breathability and lightweight fabric, with the vest, you throw that on, zip it up, and it's pretty bomber, man. Like, I've been out in extremely cold temperatures and with the proper layering. You know, I've had complete success, so, you know, comfortable all day. All right, I got a couple questions for you here, Nick. Um, you mentioned winter camping. Like, oh, you can just scoot with your friends you over, the, mellow, over huh? the next ridge and camp out <laughs> and split board. is what we do. Yeah, you yeah. scoot around. And <laughs> I've gone winter camping. It sucks ass yeah, dude it's not as mellow as he I was describes. I was just like I didn't sleep I just basically <laughs> for the entire night just uh, like I just shivered and they're like oh let's get winter camping um why like why do you like winter camping because me it's miserable <laughs> I would say for me as well yeah but but yeah the, not, gonna, don't not gonna right catch me gear, out there first of all but it's also um very intentional why you go winter camping to suffer? No, you're not <laughs> that going class B fun or whatever. <laughs> class B type two. <laughs> type two. <laughs> class class B substance. Is what you're thinking of, I think, bud. Class B misdemeanor. Yeah. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, I got no. You're that's, that's from your drug court class. You had to My go bad. to. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. No, it's very intentional of of where you're going and why you are going camping, and it's generally because it's an area that. You know, is it like a little too deep to get to in a day hit? And especially if you want to session and ride a bunch of lines around these things. And so, like, you know, maybe you get to the top of a peak and you see that peak on the horizon with a bunch of cool-looking terrain around there that you could maybe make it to in a day, but it's like getting there and there's not enough hours in the day, so you got to come home. So it's worth the effort to go out there. That first day is tough, dude. You're, you know, you have a heavy backpack, you're slogging, and it fucking sucks. But you know that you just have one day of suffering, and then you get out there, and you're set up, and then you've essentially eliminated the approach to these lines that you want to ride. And, like, you're sleeping at the bottom of these dream lines, man. It, it's the only way to to access and ride these proper things and to do it safely, right? Like with the really big lines takes a couple days or weeks even to figure out their moods. You know, when is the best time to be dropping up, dropping in? How long is it going to take to climb up? Uh, what are the key hazards that I'm looking out for? Am I seeing rock fall come down? Am I seeing slough come down? Is there a Bergschron? What's the best way around the Bergschron? And like, especially when you get into more technical lines, you know, they're a little bit more involved. It's just time consuming. So setting yourself up to be posted up in the zone is like my favorite way of, of accessing and like spending time in the mountains and really getting that full big picture vision of the zone where you're seeing that sunrise come up like maybe you're climbing the mountain you're seeing the sunrise that's always like the most special thing but like you know you're seeing that first light hit the peaks and you're you know seeing these trippy animal tracks and you're like where, 
where are those things going? And you're always trying to play detective, I feel like, out there. It's always like a, a giant puzzle to solve, uh, not only in just riding, but in what's going on around you, you know? You're watching the icicles start to melt off the trees, and, and you just get much more in tune with, with the weather, with the conditions, and it's full value, all-encompassing snowboarding, and that's what I love most. So, so talking about that, you know, for the person, like, let's say for myself, if I wanted to go you know, scoot along on my split board and, and go out somewhere and ride a zone and camp out. I need some keys to a successful, cause I know you got all kinds of hacks. Like mm-hmm. what are the keys to the su- successful camping mission? Like I've heard people boiling the Nalgene and mm-hmm. keeping it in their sleeping bag. Uh, Alex mentioned that you have some cool tricks with a thermo rest, which is those mats you sleep on. What, what's the keys to success in a snow camping mission? Uh, I'd say the main key is, uh, like, comfort is king. You want to be comfortable out there. And now that I'm, like, get a little bit older, I will kind of, you know, bring maybe more shit than I need sometimes so I can be a little bit more comfortable. Um, having an extra pair of footwear is kind of crush. Uh, some, some down booties, ideally something with, like, a sole so they're not getting wet. Some Crocs are nice. I was going to say, you're bringing your Crocs yeah, out there. Yeah, yeah for sure. Currently wearing Crocs with yeah. socks for the listeners. I'm sure. I, I am. Uh, Crocs with socks. I brought Crocs to Nepal, and they were fucking sick. That after, be able to put your foot in something dry and... Totally. And then, too, if it's sunny, like, yeah, you want it to dry out and, and the whole deal. Um, but, yeah, two thermos, like a blow-up one, and then kind of the accordion Z-pad. So then you can have that Z-pad... As like a little couch seat, maybe you make an outdoor kitchen, you're watching the sunset, whatever. Um, and having that like extra layer above the snow keeps you warmer. Um, the Nalgene and the water in the What's, sleeping bag. What is Nalgene? Nalgene is just like a water bottle. Okay. But yeah, just boil some water right before bed, put it in your water bottle and pop it in the sleeping uh. bag. And like you can put it in by your feet if your toes are cold and it really warms you up a lot. The one downside, though, is, like, you have this boiling hot water, and I drink a lot of water in the middle of the night, and so, like, if you boil all your water and it's just scalding hot and you go and take a sip and just burn your tongue, it's kind of tough. What about, like, Walmart $20 sleeping bags that yeah. we want? Is that why we had such a bad time out there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Walmart bomb hole 20 for, uh, <laughs> for yeah. your discount. Yeah. yeah, use promo code bomb hole 20 at Walmart. They'll give you <laughs> at the checkout. The lady will know exactly what you're talking about at the checkout. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, warmer sleeping bags, man. Just like if you run cold, bring more shit to wear. It's like, and I usually bring all cotton. Is that the right? Yeah, move? generally cotton's what you want, but yeah, <laughs> cotton and comfort are king. Is what they say. <laughs> um, cotton and comfort. Also, king. listen to the Cottonmouth Kings while you're out. Always it's a great band. <laughs> but what they also say too is <laughs> other words to live by. You sweat, you die. So keep that in mind. Um, you don't want to sweat out there. So you don't have proper layers, basically. Proper layering. I heard this story once. I was at Bachelor during uh, one of the events there, maybe the Derby, and someone was talking to Tom Burt, telling him about cotton, telling Tom Burt about cotton, kind of talking shit on it, like I am right now. And Tom Burt just kind of dead face looks over and goes, I climbed Denali in a cotton t shirt. <laughs> and that's all he said. <laughs> So That's some Tom Burt's pro right cotton. There. I like those I, guys. I, know. I like that too. Lucas Magoon, them. Lucas Magoon, and Tom Burt, both cotton. pro cotton. Jim Zellers has the pro tip where he brings up two base layer shirts, so you get to the top of the mountain, and he changes shirts if you sweat a lot. Yeah, so then he doesn't have that wet layer under there that's gonna and then you, what you want to do is cold. you just want to leave mm-hmm. the shirt up there and just throw it you don't need to bring Great it down for the environment <laughs> yeah 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 leave no trace now do you pack your shit out or or what actual shit yeah don't people do that yeah it depends where you are if it's like a any sort a of pack it in shit. pack it out scenario like a place like denali in the national park where they have like just a ton of traffic so they have to have this infrastructure in place because if everyone was just shitting in the snow it would be nasty and people would get sick because you're melting that snow for water Ah. so like the climbing season in denali starts early may and so say someone's going there and shitting in early may someone that gets there early june melting snow you're digging down and drinking that shit yeah it's nasty 
So you got to pack it out. So yeah, you got in, on Denali, you have uh, CMCs, clean mountain cans that you're shitting in. And you're lugging it up the mountain with you, uh, kind of this little green can. And, and you have your own personal can, so it's not that bad. Um, and then like a place like Mount Shasta, you know, that gets a lot of traffic. You They give you little wag bags. So it just kind of depends where you are. And um, and then if there are no regulations in place, kind of having that, that proper uh, knowledge of like leave no trace ethics where, you know, you're digging a proper hole. You're burning your TP and the whole deal like that. You ever fill your shit can up and have to use someone else's or something? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but you have other bags. Ah, uh, okay. So, like, you bring a group of bags up there. Um, Dope. All right. We got a guest question from none. <laughs> well, just we can talk about that for I'm like, what are we getting off of this subject? Oh, Dude, shit. you put a little sticker on your on your can there. It's good stuff Give to it some know. Flare. Yeah. All right. We got a guest question from none other than Big Mountain Jeremy mm. Jones. Here we go. Uh-oh. How's it going, Nick? Jeremy Jones here, the one that likes to walk uphill with you. Um, I think it would be interesting for you to explain the fun scale. And my question to you is, what is the perfect rating of an adventure on that fun scale? Cheers, brother. Let it snow. Thanks, Jer. What an honor to have a call from him. I like that with this show, we need to differentiate the two Jeremy Joneses and make that clear. Um, I'd like never called him Big Mountain Jeremy Jones, you know. But anywho. Is it Big Mountain and Small Mountain? Or is yeah. it? Because I think that's better than Jeremy Jones' Jim. <laughs> Jim Jones? Small Jim Mountain is better. I think we should call it. Uh, Jeremy, Small Mountain Jeremy Jones. Small Mountain Jeremy Jones. Utah Jones, Kelly yeah. Jones, I don't know. Both legends. Yeah. Obviously. Um, but as his question, I don't know if he's like referring to an inside joke that I'm uh, about spacing type, on. So what, yeah, what, what, what the context, B, yeah, class. type one fun. <laughs> so he basically walked me through oh, type yeah, one okay. fun, oh, type yeah. two fun, and type three fun. And maybe gotcha. explain that and then do you give context for what the ideal rating is for your type of fun. Gotcha. Okay, so type one fun is what you would expect uh, classic powder day. You're going up nothing but duff all day long, right? Uh, very minimal effort, easy, high reward. Type two fun is probably like the majority of uh, the snowboarding that people associate with uh, splitboarding. And that's when it's really tough and challenging at the time, pretty shitty. But when you look back, it was a really amazing experience. And all that suffering, you know, the long approach, early wake up, the cold start, cold wet boots, it's all worth it. And that is attributed to like, I feel like a lot of people that spend a lot of time in the mountains. I know for me, I have a very selective memory. So I kind of pick and choose what I recall from a, a certain mission out in the mountains. And I think that's why we keep getting ourselves back into like somewhat heinous conditions, at, you know, more often than not. Because uh, you're just remembering the good times. And like Jeremy says, the, the journey is the reward. And so it's like that whole experience that, that you're psyched on. And, you know, it's those glory moments that you're bringing home with you. Like, that was amazing. Let's go back and do that again. And then you get there at fucking three in the morning. And you're like, oh, yeah. Forgot about this. Uh, and then type three fun is when it's not fun when you're doing it and it's not fun after. And I've only had a couple of those experiences where, like, I, I wasn't too psyched. You know, it was um, just a pretty rough experience overall. Had a trip like that in Montana and then experience like that in Alaska. But, um, you know, I'd say type two fun is definitely... The most common that we encounter, I've had a lot of type two days with Jer, and that normally means we're, we're going and do, doing something that, you know, is maybe a little bit out of our uh, everyday. And it's those things in life that require a little bit of challenge from time to time that make things special and unique, you know, like nothing great in the world has ever happened from being comfortable and living in these bubbles that, that we like to live in, it's pretty easy to 
stick to our tried and true and, you know, have our routines and everything like that. But I definitely prefer to step outside that wheelhouse and experience new things, ride new lines, go to new places, just get myself into weird situations that I'd never been in before. And like the mountains are kind of the perfect canvas to do that. Okay, we got another guest question back to back from another Jones, but he goes by Kevin Jones, aka KJ. Here we go. Oh. 96. <laughs> nickel bang, nickel nickel toast. It's the bubbly fairy here, aka Nicholas Cage. <laughs> I have a question for you. More of a request for stories about when we met in Haynes. You Seemingly crawled out of the woods with a critter. I'd like to hear some stories about that critter in the movie you guys made. Say bye, Uncle Nick. Bye, Uncle Nick. Uh, Noah. Noah and Cage, thanks for the call. He, uh, I haven't spent a lot of time with the Cage the past couple of years, which has been a trip. Because when we were growing up, dude, like technical difficulties, stand and deliver, all the TB movies, Cage was larger than life, like top Uber pro, I think I see like a action figure of him on the wall, like so next level. He's a true legend. True leyundo. Mm -hmm. And now he's one of my best friends. It's cool how this whole life brings everything full circle, right? Uh, the first Jones has this, one, like a line in his movie, if, uh, you do something long enough, you're going to meet your heroes. And that's what happens. And like, that's what happened for me. And these guys are now some of my best friends that I've learned a lot from and owe a lot to these guys. So uh, very honored that they called in. But uh, Kevin is referring to my first trip to Alaska, to Haynes. I want to say it was 2012. Drove there with Wyatt Stasinos. And we had been in Baker that whole season, this was when we were making two. And um, we drove up to Alaska, no GPS, maybe no radio, working radio in the truck, one Gorilla's CD. And it took us, you know, I don't even know how long, I feel like it took us a week. Flat tires, getting lost. The, the Alcan Highway is gnarly if you guys have ever driven it. I don't really recommend it kind of takes a toll on your vehicle and on your body. But we were on a full adventure, and Wyatt had this 16-millimeter camera that him and his brother Corey had already filmed Blood, which is kind of a cult classic, 16 mil film, that had already come out. And at this point, Wyatt and I had been hanging pretty hard for uh, like two years now. And every once in a while... In life, you come across certain people that are connectors that kind of blend like one part of your life and bring you to the next stage of your life. And why is definitely a connector in my life that, you know, spending time with him and like really embracing his whole lifestyle of, of, of really living it, of living out in the mountains and doing things for the right reason, very pure and simple really changed my perspective and definitely brought me to where I am now and super grateful for the years that I had traveling around the world with him. And we yeah drove to Alaska, just kind of showed up. Um, I sort of had a loose invitation to go up there and fly in a helicopter. I'd never been in a helicopter. And so like with this loose invitation, I was like, why let's go to Alaska, dude. And so just brought him with me basically and showed up with Wyatt. We go straight to basically the edge of town to the water and we're making PB and J sandwiches out of the back of the truck. We didn't have any money. We were super broke. And first people we see was KJ and Ondo, Chris Anderson, OG standard films, uh, filmer. And I don't think I had ever met KJ at that point, but, um, you know, with literally within like first five minutes bumping into him and, seeing these mountains and kind of just this moment where you're like, oh, 
something's happening here. I, I don't know what this is, but like, I feel like I'm in the right place. Uh, like the right people are here. You know, this is it. And, uh, we went out to lunch with those guys afterwards and I remember Kevin was telling some stories of, uh, they were basically like war stories of like slough and get, just getting smoked in Alaska, you know, like heavy duty shit that you're already gripped and on the edge of your seat, like simply being in Alaska, let alone being in the mountains. And so the nerves are at all time high, just full redlining. And so hearing these stories from Cage, um, you know, essentially like warning us and like he has this look in his eyes. And I think this was kind of at like maybe a turning point for him uh, in his career. And, you know, it maybe gotten kind of burnt out on the kind of full like gas, if you will, on the scene. And um, yeah, just bumping into him and being with Wyatt in Alaska was really special. And, and I learned a lot that first year. And I honestly, I didn't really have any business being up there uh, and getting on some of the lines that I did get on. I probably like was there too early. You know, I think everything in life happens when it should and anything worth doing is worth doing slowly. But I was kind of, you know, I had this opportunity to go up there and I definitely got smoked once or twice by my slough and it took me out for sure, like twisted my back up. And that was kind of like, you know, maybe the start of like an ongoing back issue by just getting carried over a couple Bergstrons and, and some slough, just making stupid mistakes, you know, not really having the experience or the, the foresight to deal with that. Um, yeah. Solid. Cage. What's the nickname? KJ. Man? Oh, KJ. Cage. 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 Okay. Yeah, yeah, everything kind of goes Cage. into uh, abbreviations, especially when hanging with him. Yeah, just, just kind of whatever it is. Like, we definitely have our own lingo at times. And then when we hang out, we call ourselves Nick Cage. Nicholas oh, Cage. nice. Yeah. Oh, that's your duo. You guys should make a movie called Nick Cage. Uh, about talking, talking to, well, Cage. Cage. KJ. Uh, he mentioned that you are kind of a, a freakazoid on the skin track up. Um, everybody that I talk to is basically just like, you know, Nick is a psycho when it comes to ascending up the mountain. He might be up there for, you know, an hour before you get to the top of the hill. Uh, and what I'm wondering is what performance enhancing drugs are you using <laughs> slash do you recommend? And um, is it anabolic steroids or mushrooms or what? You know, what is it? What is it? What do you recommend? Run through wall smelling salts. Run through maybe. wall smelling salts. Yeah, it could be. Dude, if you guys have any, I would love to take some. Home. Oh, let's, oh, let's well, do have this. You ever take, have you ever hit one? No. We got some. Let's hit one right now. Uh-oh. If we're talking, if we're talking steroids, I mean, these are basically legal steroids here. <laughs> Squeeze it. Give Are it they sniff. legal? FDA approved? Uh, that's a little bit of a gray area. Yeah, it's a gray or okay. area. We're working on that. Crush um, here. I think it is. You squeeze it and give it a little whiff. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Woo! That's a good reaction. <laughs> it's kind of like getting salt water <laughs> in your nose. Nothing like someone's first, <laughs> watching them do their first salt, you know? Oh. Woo! <clears throat> wow. All right, we're ready to go. All right. Dude, for sure, Ooh, put that in the no first one. aid kit. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Snap you right <coughs> to it when you need it. Wow. Okay. Hoo -ah. All right. Um, you know, I think it depends on who you're with uh, in terms of, like, being fast. I think in certain circles, maybe, can could be in good shape. But I definitely – sorry, I feel, feel that. <laughs> 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 uh but, I, dude, I have some friends that are true fucking freaks out there that uh, can't hang with. So it's all relative, right? Are they ski mowers? Uh, there's some ski mowers for sure. So there's some freaks. like in, But my buddy Clark in the Tetons. Uh, yeah. Clark oh, Henry, Teton Clark, huh? Grand Teton National Clark. That's what we like to call <laughs> him. He, sound, he sounds like, um, <laughs> Ken, in the words of Kenny Powers... I play real sports. I'm not trying to be the best at exercising, you know? <laughs> Dude, I, my, uh, my other buddy from the Tetons, Murph, Nat Murphy, who deserves an air horn as well, I learned a lot from both of those guys in the Tetons. But I remember once, like years ago, just kind of had this offhand remark, like, we're not trying to break records out here. And so, you know, I'm never really trying to take it too seriously in the, uh, on the uphill 
side of things. You know, there's a big difference between schemo and like the backcountry scene, you know. Um, definitely wear a lot baggier pants and the whole deal. Uh, don't dodge the performance enhancing drugs question, though, by the way. You gotta, can't, for, can't have you forget that. Fully back the microdoses. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Psilocybin for the uh, listeners. Yeah, I'm a fan. Not like, I'm not like full mushroom guy. I can't tell you any facts or stats about it, but uh, I've definitely dabbled and it definitely works. It definitely helps. On the uphill. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, both like just in life or on the uphill? Know, in the mountains, in the for mountains. sure. I don't really do that off the mountains. I think when you're younger, you know, maybe yeah. you eat some, some mushrooms and try to party. Business. The micro dosing. On the on the stock market or something. Yeah, it's supposed to make you think outside the box a little bit. And yeah, I mean, it's so much more socially acceptable to talk about it these days. Yeah, we're talking micro dose, though. We're you know micro, I mean? like, micro, sometimes accidental macro. You know, <laughs> at times it's it's may or may not. Big difference between micro and macro. Yeah, out like there. the clouds start having a little bit more <laughs> definition to them, um, and the sky's a little brighter. It sparkles in the snow are a little brighter, but yeah, very micro and. uh it helps for sure. And I think it's going to be legalized, like, you know, definitely uh, medicinally here pretty soon. Yeah, I've heard that. And I think certain places it already is. Maybe Colorado, I think it already is. Probably. Yeah, I'm not sure, though. Maybe Oregon. I don't know. Yeah, Oregon. R- run through a like wall, it. smelling salt, a little micro dose. You're up at the top of the hill before Boom. you know it. Boom. <laughs> yeah, we call, like, like weed, we'll call hill flatteners. <laughs> 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 just makes it all flat and you just cruise along totally when you're in some mundane terrain you know like not when you're getting into the gnar but yeah. like when you're in some mundane terrain and you gotta cover some miles like yeah why not take some makes hill flat yeah. I got a quick Patreon question yeah uh, this is from Clovis and he's asks among split borders who puts in the best slash worst skin tracks in your opinion what's a bad skin track a bad skin track is straight up the mountain. You'll see a lot of that out here in the Wasatch. And we'll ha- like we got this area in Tahoe on the West Shore where it's kind of like a notorious, really steep skin track that gets put in. And I think a lot of that is based off of uh, like dawn patrollers going up and trying to get their fill before they got to go to work. And it's a lot easier... If you're the first one up, it's, it is easier for you to go straight up. You have a lot more uh, attraction, whatever. But if you're, like, trying to set a skin track, understanding that you're in a zone that a lot of people are maybe going to use it, um, kind of a dick move. So, like, especially if it's deep and you're breaking trail, like, I feel like that's a, some of the community service aspect of, of being a steward of the mountains is, you know, oftentimes, like, you get somewhere first, and so we're setting the track to go into these places, like the crew that I'm with. And you want to set a good track. And so, like, apparently, I don't know what the actual degree of steepness is, but in a guides course, they tell you that whatever that degree is, it's basically, like, you should never have to put your, um, like, high high heel risers on, second level. Like, you should only just be in the main one. And kind of when you start going straight up, you start slipping. And after a few people have been up there, it like, gets really slippery and it gets frustrating. And I think that's really tough for uh, you know people first getting into split boarding. And, but something to remember is like if there's a skin track somewhere and it sucks, it's super icy, whatever, blown out on kick turns, like just set your own skin track. It's a lot easier. Set a new one. Set a new one. Make a few more make a few more switchbacks there. You know, it's gonna save yourself the energy. And that's how I feel like people just coming out in the early stages get worked so easy and like have this bad taste in their mouth with split boarding is that like maybe the track that you took wasn't the best way. Like a proper route through the mountains should be seamless and you know you shouldn't be working too hard out there. I have a question. Do you detune your middle edges between your split board so they don't catch at all on hard pack, or do you just leave them razor sharp? Razor sharp. Okay. Who, someone was telling us to detune. I think it was Kevin. Uh, Cage. Cage. Yep. Um, hmm. We got a great Patreon question in regards to the ascent up the skin track and, uh, I guess, banter gods. Who's that from? Yes. This one is from Johnny Mandio, and he says, You have shared the skin track... With an all-time list of amazing snowboarders, skiers, men, and women from all around the world, I gotta know 
Who are your top five skin track banter gods? Good question. That is a good question. Uh, taking the top spot would have to be the doctor, Jeremy Jones. The doctor. Yeah, Dr. Jones. He's a uh, like a spineologist, kind of like a chiropractor, you know, really good at spines. But, I thought uh, that was he, like Indiana the, Jones reference there or something, but it's not. It's a lot of, I mean, yeah, no. It, it, Dr. Jones. It, it, Dr. Jones, you say no touch anything. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't touch anything. Great movies. <laughs> yeah. Uh, riding with Jer is great because some people you go out and they'll, you know, it's like kind of a race kind of. And the fast friends that I'm talking about, they'll be 10 minutes in front of you for like four hours. Like, oh, great, going riding with you today. I got to see the back of your backpack, you know. Uh, but Jeremy, will, you know, anytime you're going riding with him, you're holding the conversation the entire time, and we go at a pretty civil pace. Um, you know, a good pace is when you can hold a conversation while you're walking or hiking and whatnot. And with him, like, you know, you'll be talking about things from snowboarding to climate to giving advice on relationships and sponsors and, and the whole, just life in general, you know. So he's like very good mentor and, and friend in the mountains to, to chat with. Um, Can we get an impersonation of something he might say? Yeah. Uh, you know, Nick, the thing about that is uh, it's like slough management, man. And, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Let's face it. Danny does a really good one. <laughs> Danny's impersonation. Danny's just an impersonation insane. god out there. Huh? Would you With put everybody. him on your banter? He's got to be on oh, the banter. Oh, he's, he's definitely on the box. Um, Danny and I once, we uh, had this idea that we wanted to start a podcast, like as inspo from you guys, and it was going to be based on the mountain, on the skin track, and we were going to be mic'd up. And we never did it. You know, it was just kind of one of those half-baked ideas. But we definitely had a day walking around pretending that we were doing a podcast. <laughs> <That sounds> epic. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Impersonations mixed with some really heavy breathing is what that would be. But. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> the thing about that. Uh, <laughs> sounds like a great podcast. Those might have been some like accidental macros involved. <laughs> Macro, right not micro that day. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we got Jeremy, we got Danny D. Who else is on the list? We got... Jim Zellers, Tahoe, <laughs> mountain riding, OG, the godfather. Yeah, he must be snowboarding for like 40 years, that guy, huh? Probably, that yeah. Long time. Yeah, he was definitely snowboarding from like the very first days. Yeah. And he would say they would go up on the uh, hill above Highway 80 right by Boreal and just ride the little hillside there because they weren't allowed on the resort. Uh, he uh, he would be a good person to get in the booth. Early days. Yeah, but Jim, you know, another great mentor, great friend that just has a lot of wisdom. And I think the thing about a good mentor like that is, like, they're not straight up with you. It's not – they don't want to give you the whole – cake on the platter right they want to give you crumbs and leave that on the trail for you to kind of decipher and put the pieces together yourself like they want you to have this full adventure and get the full experience of trial and error but they'll do the best they can to kind of help you along the way and steer you in the right direction so like I've been super fortunate to have been kind of brought up and introduced into this whole thing by the godfathers of of this style of snowboarding and I definitely think about that every day of how lucky and, and grateful I am for that opportunity um, but yeah he's a uh, great person to chat with on the skin track we got a couple more? Two yeah. more, that's three think, uh, that's three, yeah Okay, uh, Ming uh, excuse me, Ming Poon, photographer at a Trekkie, is always talking. And then, you know, third person, I'd say Michelle Parker. It's a great one to have a chat with. Good list. All right, Nick, you know what it's time for. Oh. Name that video part. Mm, here we go.
Name That Video Part is presented by Mammoth Mountain. Now, they have a whole bunch of snowboard parks over there. And if you want to go from learning your first 50-50 to hitting your first jump all the way to learning 1440s, you can do it at Mammoth. They even got a mini pipe where Buds just puts a beat down on that thing. Love that pipe over there. Heard and they might... got a big pipe for you to do your cripplers in. Yeah, huh? I heard uh, Buds is saying the Switch McTwist might come out of retirement. <laughs> we'll see. Just We got to get over there and uh, get those reps up, right? I even seen they have an airbag for the U.S. team. Uh, that would be a good place to, for you to relearn the Switch Mickeys. Yeah, well, let's get in there. Get me on the airbag. Let's go. Safety first. Safety first. Safety first. Also, if you just want to rail turns... Uh, uh, ridden it with uh, Big Mountain Jeremy Jones and had fun carving around. That was a bit of a that was a bit of a flex, a little bit of a name drop. <laughs> Dropping but, names. Uh, Jimmy yeah. Goodman too is kind of mammoth poster child. Mm-hmm. Follow him around. Find mammoth has mountains. amazing terrain, <laughs> huge mm-hmm. mountain. So if you're looking for a great uh, vacation or a great place to go snowboarding, and you're looking for somewhere to go, I highly recommend checking out Mammoth Mountain. Now it's time for name that video part. How you feeling? <laughs> Confidence level zero through ten. Shaking his boots over there. Shaking my Crocs. 50 50 odds, I guess. I should either get it. 50 or, 50 uh, odds. I don't know if that's right. It's not a yes or no question. <laughs> yeah, true. Well, I, I'll either get it right or I won't, right? Yeah. Uh, true, yeah. Yeah, I should either I know think it. The odds aren't in a 50. Whatever, yeah, either sure way. about I mean. the odds there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Let's give it a three. Pretty Confidence. Bad. All right. Here we go. Robot food. That's correct. Movie. And uh, all productions have their style. And like, so you know if it's a robot food, you know if it's a standard or absinthe, whatever. Robot food. Um, we're going to. I have no idea to be honest, but I, it's probably like a Louis Fountain. I got, or... I got another. So I stopped it, but there's, there's a little more to the song. This is going to be a little bit more of a crumb. Here we go. And here we have a mailbox, rickety Parker's. old mailbox. I know, yeah. On Travis top of gas pumps. I should have. That was a oh, meatball. No. You got that it right. That was a meatball. You got it right. But uh, also, I'm going to go yeah, ahead and say you. that's my favorite video part in the entire world, and it's Travis Parker in Afterbang. That's uh, your favorite part in the world. That's my favorite part wow. ever made. Just the blend of like lighthearted snowboarding, tricks, the editing. He's spinning around on the trash can. He's doing butters. Um, that was a sick part. It's just top like, of the trash can there. The little mm-hmm. not a spin. He's doing like he does a cab yeah. nine nose. He does a back rodeo nine. Like back rodeo seven mute grab. Such a random trick. But anyway, uh, love that part. And what you just won is a bomb hole Yeti carry all. Wow. Filled with bomb hole merch. Yeah, thank uh, you. You got some sweatpants in there. You got a hoodie. You got some socks. Thank you. Um, yeah. All available where, buds? Bombhole.com. We forgot to throw in, we'll throw in uh, some bomb hole run through a wall smelling salts as mm. well. Uh, and you can give us your uh, review on on S- peace. Slip them in your uh, back country. See how back. enhancing they are for your performance. Yep. Yeah. Dude, thank you guys. I brought something for you as well. Oh, oh wow. We get, some, we get a little gift. Yeah, little yeah. Gift. Oh, this is great. Ooh. Little secret Santa here. <laughs> yeah, little secret Santa. We love you, know, this. you guys have so much memorabilia that like I didn't really know what to bring. And so just coming home from Nepal, oh, I figured wow. you guys could use a little flare of uh, some prayer flags here. And That's you, you amazing. Can decide where they go, maybe right in front of the desk here. Yeah. Um, th- these are like a long, long set for sure, so you can wow. slice them and dice them. Wow, that's really cool. Wow, thank you for the gift. Yeah, that's you're welcome. Special. Straight from, from Kathmandu. And what do these things exactly, what do they mean? They basically uh, like signify, signify, Sorry, signify a blessing to, to the gods above. And they're supposed to promote peace and well-being, uh, <coughs> Tibetan prayer flags. And they, they each kind of represent an uh, element. So earth, sky, fire, wind, and clouds. Um, so it kind of has it all. Wow, thank you for this thoughtful gift, Nick. It feels good yeah, to get to get a special Dude, gift. And I know you went to That's the end really of the freaking cool. world to get those things. These are this is really long it too. Is. Huh? They're pretty long. Yeah, we'll place, have to place we'll, it up for the episode. All right, our set is looking dialed in. We got the Tibetan flag. And uh, for part, thank you so much again for that. that it feels good. Kind. It warms the heart to get it. Does. A gift. I really appreciate that. Um and part two, this is for the listeners. If you know the video part, comment on the photo of Nick's face on our Instagram when his episode comes out. 
And that is where we pick our winner. Here we go. This one's kind of for the OGs. Okay. Thank you guys for playing. Name that video part. It's a rock and roll song right there. So I heard that I think around 2015, um, you kind of had some adversity that you battled, and I'd love for the listeners to hear that story. Yeah. Um, you know, I got really sick in 2015, started the winter. I was getting ready to head out on the road for the season with Wyatt and his brother Corey, and just started feeling shitty, kind of flu-like symptoms, so I went to the doctor and they thought it was pneumonia. So they gave me some antibiotics and like a week or more went by and still started feeling just terrible. And it all of a sudden became really hard to breathe. And we were in Jackson Hole at this point and went to the hospital to go get a chest x-ray. Basically, the doctor comes in telling me that they need to life flight me to Salt Lake City. They found a grapefruit size abscess in my liver right here that was pushing up against my lung and that's why it was so hard to breathe and kind of was feeling just so sick that I was very out of it and didn't really understand the severity of it at the time even though I was being medevaced to Salt Lake in the middle of the night and ended up in the hospital there for over a month uh, essentially bedridden and there were doctors coming in all hours of the night, like specialists, basically trying to figure out what was wrong with me because they didn't know there was no cause to it. Um, and, you know, I had like whittled down to skin and bones. I was, you know, 130 pounds. I couldn't get out of bed. And, you know, they told me that my white blood cell count was, you know, at critically low levels. So they ended up having to put drains into the abscess to try to rid it of, you know, kind of whatever was in there. And I remember like going in for one of the procedures and I'm laying on the table or before going into the, to the room, they had me sign a, like a living will of sorts. And so that's kind of when the severity of it all hit me that like, I was like right on the edge of dying. The doctor came in sort of when I was coming back to, and like, you don't realize how close you were to like, and gone. My parents had come in. My dad stayed with me in the hospital the whole time. I'm like super thankful for that. Um, you know, he's stayed on like uncomfortable couch for a month that I was in the hospital. And yeah, they never, they couldn't figure out what caused this thing. And eventually I get discharged. I started feeling a little bit better, but I still had drains in the liver. And so I'm leaving, you know, essentially with this big IV kit and like it was a whole thing. And had to go to my parents' house to recover. They told me that I wouldn't be feeling back to normal for at least a year. This is probably March at this point. And when you're so debilitated physically, but not mentally, it like can go two ways, really, like if you're injured or sick. And you can either get really depressed and get into a really dark space and things can go bad, or you can use that as motivation to get strong again and rehab and do whatever it is that you can to get healthy. And so like at this point, everything from eating right to as much, you know, physical therapy as I could do, I basically had to relearn how to walk, like walking up and down the stairs at my parents' house was the extent of the early physical therapy. And, you know, I had people doing Reiki on me from across the country and people praying for me and the whole deal. And that's kind of when I started to more lean into like a spiritual aspect of life that like I'll do whatever I can to get better right now. And, and I believe in it all, 100 percent, like Western medicine can take you so far and granted that is like what saved my life but I think everything else is what helped me like helped me on the back end and I was fired up I really wanted to get back on snow that was like the light at the end of the tunnel that's what kept me sane 
and having something like snowboarding is like a very, very special and privileged thing to have to, to look forward to. So I use that as motivation. And by the end of April, I was back out here and had a powder day with Griffin Siebert. I remember it. It was my first day on snow and it was powder. I wasn't even supposed to be alive. And then I'm snowboarding and a month and a half later. And then kind of into springtime, many of the resorts had closed down and kind of powder season was winding down. So the only place that I could go riding was on these volcanoes in the Northwest that you had to hike for from like Shasta up to Rainier. And that was really the first time I had sort of delved into the more like bigger mountain scene, like bought my first pair of crampons and ice axe to be able to go up these things. And I was with my homie Murph that, you know, kind of showed me this new side of the sport. Yeah, shout out Murph. And by the end of it, we just went on a full volcano tour and we were riding a new volcano like every couple of days. And by the end of it, I think we were in like eight or nine of the volcanoes, uh, you know, like Hood, Shasta, Rainier, the Sisters, um, Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams, and and everything was just this whole new adventure. And that sort of sparked this like newfound passion for maybe the style of riding that I am into now. And then also really like a just an exclamation point to like take advantage of the time we have on snow when you have a healthy body take advantage of it like it's a really special thing that can be gone in a blink of an eye and you know just to to be able to go snowboarding again was such a gift and like it can be taken away in a second you know and and it was just like a testament to the fragility of life that was kind of another one of those like life-changing moments for me and pretty much like up until now still like I, I use that as motivation and kind of maybe why I'll, I'll go to these sort of extreme depths of of the snowboarding scale at times they never figured out what the abscess was from grapefruit size that's a big dog big dog for sure you must have been able to like see it huh the, like a lump no, surprisingly, there so deep up in you. There wasn't. Um, you know, they thought that maybe it was from some travel. Like I'd been traveling the year before, like Mexico, but in Thailand. But the the timeline didn't really match up to when I actually got the symptoms. So I was just like one of those mysteries it in just life, happened. dude. Yeah, like shit happens. That's so, a heavy one. Yeah, man. The, you you touched on kind of some spiritual spirituality stuff there mm-hmm. and and I like I like getting deep let's let's go deep let's go, let's go deep spiritual on let's them. go spiritual on them but there is a deep connection between being in the mountains walking around nature I just noticed for myself like <clears throat> go to the mountains almost every weekend whether it's mountain biking dirt biking snowboarding <clears throat> I I noticed that the effect it has on me is that like sometimes the faster paced life of the city makes my stress levels go up. The mountains make my stress levels go down. And I've just noticed I'm at my happiest when I'm peaceful. And you appear to be like the way you talk, your cadence. You seem to be a person that's that's at peace. Uh, what effects do the mountains have on you? Only good ones. I mean, no, we get scared and we deal with some shit for sure. But, uh, yeah, I totally agree with that sentiment. Everything comes together when you're out there, you know. I think moving through the mountains with purpose slowly gives you this bigger picture view of life uh, in ways that you can't really put into words of, of what it all means, you know. But you know that there's there's some grand existence out there and and that's when you feel it you're not going to feel it when you're stuck in traffic you know you're not going to feel it like i I like to say i'm allergic to walls like (laughs) that's why i got run through the wall smelling so (laughs) those are gonna be perfect for you break right through those fuckers yeah um but man it does give you this feeling of like higher purpose and like you want to do great things right it like fires you up and you can 
you can see life through this 30,000 foot view when you're up on a ridge top and like, or you, whatever, just in the woods and like everything is kind of pulled out. Like you're getting this very intimate view of the landscape that you're in, but also this like pulled out macro view of the world around you. And I think there's like very few things in life that provide a perspective like that. And, you know, being outside is, is the key thing that's like common with whatever you have, you know, whether it's dirt biking, climbing, surfing, these are the things that, that connect us to the world around us and like, you know, who you are as a person. It's interesting as listening to you talk because being in the mountains has this deep, profound effect on everybody that goes there. You, you feel calm, you feel maybe there's a bit of introspection where you're taking some time to think about life and what matters and mm -hmm. bigger issues. And, and But I also think there's a degree that as humans, we are reliant on our community. Like community is a huge sense of purpose. So I think there's a balance probably of not being a complete hobbit where you're just isolated in the, in the mountains all the time, but maybe having a community mixed with getting that time in the mountains. 100%. You know, I'm definitely a pretty solitary person. I feel like the majority of the time, but you know, you do need to break out of that and friends and family is like the most important thing. And that's what like carries you through the hard times when you're by yourself through a dark period, you know, you, you're not going to get through it unless you have people around you. And, you know, I like to think that, yeah, we recreate in these mountains, but it's the people that encompass the foothills that make them really special. It's those communities around us. It's the snowboard communities, the ski communities, like just the greater outdoor world um, that, that bring it all together and make the mountains feel like home. You know, hobbits actually have a really great sense of community. <laughs> <laughs> Bud's been sitting on that one. He's been waiting. Uh, yeah, hobbits. Bilbo actually, Baggins and yeah, those guys. And yeah. Those hobbits are yeah, that's, community people. Yeah, yeah. It's good. You fit a lot of them in those trees. <laughs> yeah. I think about too, but that's that gnome. Yeah, e-gnome. E -gnome. Actually, e -gnome. shout out right to there. Bud's new mug too. Yeah. I think you're rocking the e-gnome yeah, mug. The old e-gnome. Uh, it's available at bombhole.com. <laughs> Uh, use promo code GRANOLA69 for 0% <laughs> off. Yeah. No, But going back to the mountains, I, I mean, I'm going to stay on a deep level for another minute because yeah, I, I like this stuff. But I've noticed that, um, like, recreating is also a huge form of staying healthy mentally. It's a huge form of inhibiting creativity like, you know, in order, like, for, I'll just speak on, on my life and what we do, right? So let's say if, if, if I'm in this office and I'm only working on podcasts and I'm, and I'm just grinding and I'm, I'm looking at what's right in front of me, I have no creative ideas. We're just going through the motions. We're just, we're just doing tasks, right? But I find that when we go up into the mountains and we get away for the weekend and all of a sudden... I got fucking ideas coming in left and right. Boom. They're hitting me. Oh, we should do that. We should do this. Like, it's like this creativity and mental health just like realigns and you're just like, Oh, life's good again. I'm, I'm back. You know? Oh dude, totally. The best ideas come for me on the skin track. Like yeah. in my phone, I got so many notes that even looking back on, I'm like, what the fuck was I talking about? Here, just like random things. I'm like shadow puppets. Like what? <laughs> what is that? Even? Might have been a macro <laughs> dose on the skin. <laughs> macro. Yeah, possibly. But no, I agree. Like you need that uh, that outside time and like outside of your bubble too. I think that's why traveling is really good for people to kind of give you some perspective of these bubbles that we live in. Even like within our communities, you know, like. You got to see what the other scenes are like, you know, it's like, cause everyone thinks that what you're doing is the shit and that's the way it goes. And then you go, you know, somewhere else and you get really humbled that way. But dude, I, I think about this a lot. Cause like when I am not in the mountains, I'm, I'm trying, it's a balance and I'm tr trying in my life to f work on this balance. Like life is really hard doing your taxes and bills it's it's hard it's overwhelming like we didn't learn how to fucking do our taxes in school like the whole schooling system is kind of a joke it's like based off of memorization and you're not actually learning these things 
like these life skills that like maybe I don't have. And so I do get really <laughs> overwhelmed at times uh, when you got to get to work and like take care of admin and kind of life duties at times. And everything that I do sort of is like, a, I'm like making all of these plans and building up and taking care of what I got to do so I can go out and not have any plans. And like, as say like, do what you got to do when you got to do it so you can do whatever it is that you want to do when you want to do it. Just take care of your shit and then go out and unplug. And that's like the, been the best therapy for me. There's so much good stuff there because thinking about like in order to live a lifestyle that you want to live that allows you to get into the mountains, you have to structure your way, your life in a way that lends itself to that. And that's a huge... What do you want to do in life? Well, I got to set myself up so I can do the things that keep, I don't even say make me happy. I'm going to go as far as say is keep me sane. No you know? doubt. Right. And, and that, that's super, super important to footnote. It's like, like the people that we've had sit in that chair, a lot of them have, have set their lives up so that they can live the life they want. And I think that's really inspiring. Dude, it doesn't happen by accident. You know, no matter what you're doing, if you're living out your passion, does not happen by accident and it takes a lot of hard work to do that you got to make a lot of sacrifices in your life and in the early stages like relationships are going to suffer your bank account is going to suffer like I mean I've missed a lot of maybe like important life events because of like you know sometimes it's seemingly this selfish pursuit and that's something I definitely struggle with at times like I missed my grandfather's funeral because I was going, I was flying to uh, Argentina to get on a boat to go to Antarctica. And that was like a really unique opportunity that, you know, I battled with it for a long time. And ultimately I decided that he would have told me to fucking get on that boat and go to Antarctica like how often do you have that opportunity? But it's like little things like that, you know, like relationships suffer. It's it's really hard to be there mentally and like be present when you're home, when we live in this la-la land in the mountains. And I, I definitely struggle with that, especially like coming home from a big trip and getting back into a social setting of sorts, like... Jeremy calls it a uh, post-traumatic stoke disorder. <laughs> <laughs> PTSD. Yeah, we're like, I mean, you get home from a big trip from Alaska and it takes me, you know, like two weeks to, to recover from that, like physically and mentally. And Nepal, you know, very slow re-entry back into society, you know, where before in the mountains, everything is so much more simplified that... You're not thinking about all, all, all these other things, you know. You're not thinking about the emails and, you know, like, you're not thinking about the phone calls and blah, 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 whatever it is. And definitely a balance I'm personally working on. I like what you said there, too, though, because when you, you're talking about being in the mountains like that, it's a simple life, right? You, what are you doing? You're feeding yourself. You, you, there's really no outside distractions happening, and... I think in the world that we live in today, we have this phone where we want to, we see it on the internet. We, we can do it all. We want to do, like, I, I struggle with this all the time. Oh, I want to go surfing. Oh, I want to go here. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do everything. And, and I think, you know, I'm, I, as I get older, what I'm realizing, and I'm not doing a good job of living this, but like maybe I aim to get into, a place to live like this, but I think a simple life is actually a good life. Like, what are the what are the simple things that that make me happy? Not, I don't want to do everything. I don't want to do it all. What What are the simple things that that make me sane and focus on those? And it seems like you're a person that's set your life up very well to live like that. I think it's easy to get greedy nowadays that we have like these distractions of social media and whatnot which is like probably a pretty like I think it's like a overwhelmingly negative thing there are good things about it for sure but 
but there's I, I think majority negative, and and that's really like FOMO inducing. Yes, a lot of FOMO, a lot of FOMO on the internet. Yeah. Going into this last year, like my two intentions were: don't get FOMO and try to be more patient. And with filming, you need to be really patient. Um, but with with the internet and everything, you see all these things, and you can't help but somewhat compare yourself to, to these things that you're seeing. Like it, I think our brains are just wired that way. Like if you're looking at it, you know, so like, I think taking these extended breaks is a really good thing. And so I love being able to go into the mountains for like several week long trips, you know, camped out on, on expeditions because like there's not really many opportunities in life where you like, it's not even an option. You know, like there is no cell reception. You are in the middle of nowhere, you know. And so it's like always that that uh, re-entry is like, whoa, like you're scrolling through the feed and it's always like a week. You're like, I don't even care about this shit. And it's yeah. great. <laughs> like you feel so good. And then after a while, you're like, oh, fuck, I'm like been looking at dogs for 20 minutes or like whatever it is, <laughs> you know, like looking at waves. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and then with patience, dude, Going into this year with uh, with trying to film, I I like haven't filmed a ton of like we we've, we've filmed a lot, but I don't really enjoy it too much because it takes time away from the act of snowboarding. You got to do a lot of waiting, and you end up snowboarding a lot less on those film days. And so, having this goal in mind with this year, uh, that was like one of my main main intentions. Now talk about filming. Let's get into let's get into some projects. So mm -hmm. uh, you've done a lot of uh, cool ones. Um, I kind of want to start by asking, you know, like some of the bigger ones, like the TGRs and the Warren Millers. We're so used to, you know, at least in this podcast in our world, trick porn. I'll call it. You know, where it's just like you're going out. You just want twenty four bangers for your part or whatever it is. And a lot of the stuff you're doing is like storytelling, and a lot of it is with skiers. So, what what are the differences between the projects you're working on, like the, the versus you know trick porn? Yeah, I think with going into the mountains like in an expedition mindset, there is a lot more storytelling involved because there is a lot more involved with it. Um, you know, it's definitely like so much. I mean, it's a process no matter what, but, you know, you are working pretty damn hard just to be able to go snowboarding uh, when you're doing it on foot. So I feel like there is kind of a natural draw to seeing this behind the scenes, if you will, this storyline to it that I was personally drawn to, like with Jer's movie. And that's like what drew me in because I like, get seems somewhat attainable where it's like hey this guy is doing this and he seems like a pretty normal guy like why can't I do this and hopefully with the films that we do that's what we portray to the viewers is like yeah hey, I, I, like why can't I do this like I have decent fitness you know if you get the skills you can you get the gear and like everyone's on a different level of course but it's these like steps taken and I think people can relate to like a humanizing aspect of of this style of riding because like it's pretty hard watching Ben Ferg Chuck and and be like I can do that <laughs> like I, I watch Sparky and, and those dudes and I'm like what the fuck are you doing dude like yeah, the average what person it's not attainable yeah, yeah, it's not attainable or like these relatable. Foot booters, like it's, it's we need to have those guys in the sport. Hundred percent, you need to have those guys pushing the the aerial progression of things. But I think like progression can come in different forms, and you know, in free riding, it comes in different forms. Riding new lines, riding classic lines in good style, like fast and flowy single pitch in lines that like are traditionally reserved for like springtime like pitching it out you know like riding a line in sections and so like taking that uh like mess like mountaineery mindset and applying that to snowboarding is like what shroudbanism is right there uh as like taking this free ride aspect and 
blending it with like the alpinism and climbing. And I think a lot of people like it, you know, I think maybe it's like a bit niche in our world in snowboarding, but like the people that are into it are pretty fucking into it, you know, like, and I think that's because like, they just understand how much effort it takes to do these things. But, um, yeah, like the, the story based filming is kind of like the route that I've gone the past couple of years, just because, you know, there is so much to like, tell about going to some remote peak in Bolivia that if you were just to show this the the shot you know be like oh whatever he's like scratching down this thing but when you see everything else that went into it it's like that's kind of cool you know yeah I need to know that you went to Bolivia and hear that story that's cool range of mystery yeah yeah did you coin the term uh shroudpanism yeah no up for debate I'm not debate I'm not gonna claim it but um I think like you know, I like sometimes you like think you come up with something, but someone else came up with something. Yeah, it's like, like simultaneous it's it's like, invention. Like snowboarding. Like people think like Sherman Poppins yeah. invented it. But at the same time, there's, uh, you know, the dudes in Europe, what's his name? Dimitri or something? Yeah, Dimitri. Yeah, yeah so like th- there was a crew in Europe doing it at the same time, sliding down pieces of wood. And then in Turkey, where Alex Yoder and I went, they have been doing that for hundreds, if not thousands of The guys years. with the sticks? Yeah. Yeah, we went to that village. You did? Yeah, Patron. I went to Those are the OGs. and heard about it, but I didn't go to that village. Those that are is real. arguably... There's photos of it everywhere. I give it to the, the, the Turkish homies. The Turkish, I think they're those. For sure, they they take the cake on the but There's the probably people before them, though. There's that, also a, a statistic that like 50% of our memories are like... You know, you, you ever you ever hang correctly. out with somebody and like you something guys have you've this subconsciously si- heard? Yeah, like you, you there are a lot like there are like you ever go like something happened with one of your friends and you hear them tell the story and you're like, I don't remember it like that at all. And who knows who's right or wrong, right? Like over time, it yeah, just over time blurs. it changes, and you're like, yeah. so, so I think there is like I I think that sometimes we trust our memories to be right a little too much when it's like. I think I invented it, but I don't know, you know? I think that's, like, a good way to approach that type of stuff. Totally. It's like, um... People it, are all- in my mind, I invented beer pong, but I don't think I did. <laughs> <laughs> I just know I was playing it way back when. Yep. I was the first to do this. <laughs> now they're selling well, it at 7-Eleven. Was that in 1408? That was, when, that was back when you guys actually. used to <laughs> take the horse and buggy to the yes. hill. Yeah. We had to carve the the pong things out of wood back then. Yeah, you did. Just using rocks. Yeah, yeah. rocks as the ping pong ball. It's hard to bounce them in. <laughs> so when you went to Turkey, were you able to actually ride on some of those? Or, or oh no? yeah, oh you did. Yeah, we went there with wow. the intention of like uh, getting into this community, right? And so we went there and we we went splitboarding for a week. It's kind of crazy. Uh, full like first place I had ever been. First and only place I had ever been where you need a translator everywhere you go. So Yoder had lined it up. We had a translator traveling with us. And then we ended up in Patron. So it's called Patron boarding. Some people call it LAS boarding. LAS boarding is, uh, it was a term coined from the LAS people, which is the Black Sea region. But they, the OGs call it Patron boarding. And so Patron is this town in the foot, this village in the foothills of the Kachkar Mountains. And nobody riding these boards is younger than 50 years old. So it's like pretty fucking cool. And we met this guy, Hazir, who's kind of the godfather taking the reins. Yeah. And we made a board with him, you know, very, um, you know, very basic, uh, just kind of some like pieces of wood slapped together. And then you rub cow fat on the bottom wax and so he like made this board kind of latched it all together put it on the wood burning stove put a uh, boiling pot of water on the nose and left it on there for however long and then enough time to like pull the nose up to kind of give it a little bit of a shovel kick to it put the string on and you have this stick in the back for the rudder and we just got super lucky and coincidentally timed this with the Patron boarding festival there were like it had to be like a hundred or two hundred people that rolled up there, and they're all wearing these like wool suits and like basically wooden shoes, 
you know, and shredding these boards and super simple, you know, you're just going straight down. So simple, so rudimentary and the funnest thing ever. Like everything was just so simplified and like talk about bringing back to the roots. Like that was it. And so we spent a week with this guy just kind of hang, like he couldn't speak a lick of English. No one out there could speak yeah. English. So you're just communicating through smiles and nods, right? And going riding, and, and he's showing us his favorite hills to ride all through the town. And we're riding through these mosques and, you know, the, just these little like thatched buildings. And it was such a crazy experience. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. we brought a board home with me, and I still ride it on uh, like backyard pow surf days. It's it's such a good bring it back to the roots like that's all we're doing sliding down the hill on a piece of wood and look at that's like it. Look, look at what it's come to <laughs> yeah, look what it's come you know to. we we freaking come in here and talk about it all we talk about is people sliding down the hill on a piece of wood but the OG's been doing it forever yeah, did that OG simple. like see your setup and trip out on it or you know it's funny so he he has a kid that's you know probably like in his teens and. Nicholas Mueller is his favorite snowboarder. Oh, okay, so he knew about it all. Yeah, he knew. The, the younger kids know about snowboarding just because of the internet and everything, but they don't Patron board. They ride regular snowboards. Yeah. And so this guy, his years trying to, like, maintain the, the, the culture. culture of it yeah. all. Yeah. And so kind of the godfather, and, like, he was doing clinics, teaching people how to build boards and trying to keep this tradition alive because it's like a sort of a dying thing, you know, as, as we trend into new age connectiveness. And Yoder actually left him a board, a Gentum board, that he'll post uh, gram clips every now and then of him riding it. I traded him a Pouser for a mine, a Chris Christensen board, and he gave me one of his boards. And I was like, super sick trade. That's so cool. That's dope. And, well, you know who would probably do good in there is the tobogganist, the Mikey tobogganist LeBlanc. tobogganist would kill it. Yeah, he the, would crush. Dude, tob- I mean, that's basically a Patron board right there. That's mm-hmm. it. Uh, sidebar, I just remembered you talked about Shralpinism, and uh, Jeremy Jones has a book coming out. I believe it's called The Art of Shralpinism. He does, yeah. Yep, I so. mean, like, talk about Godfathers. The guy literally wrote a book on mountain Shralpinism. riding. On Shralpinism and big wow. mountain riding. It's pretty fucking cool. All right, we have a, we got a lot of projects to talk about. Uh, one that stood out to me was the big one, where you did Denali. Uh, Denali, I don't know how you say it. It's it, yeah, I, I, it's Denali. Denali. Yeah, okay. some like mass roots coming through. Yeah, the mass. There, there's no <laughs> Duncan Dees <laughs> D- D- up there. <laughs> Fuck you, Denali guy. You <laughs> Denali. Like, well, Denali. Fun, dude, it was sack. Pack, pack the car and like climb Denali. Yeah. Was sick, dude, kid. my fucking boy Nick climbed Denali. He's <laughs> like a sick puppy, that kid. Sick uh, okay, puppy. so it's twenty thousand feet. It's twelve hour ascent, fourteen thousand feet of climbing. Uh, Eighteen days on the mountain. And you guys had an all-star crew at Ian Walsh with you. Uh, I just want to hear you talk about that trip. That was a dream trip, dude. Um, You know, you dream of what the perfect scenario would be. And, like, what are those ingredients? It's a good crew, good weather, good conditions, good terrain. And Denali is the highest peak in North America. It's known for very treacherous weather at times. Many people have lost their lives on the mountain uh, and have just gotten completely beat down. And these bigger mountains are completely hit or miss. You can go there and one year it can be on and in the next year the whole mountain's a sheet of blue ice and nothing's rideable. And so going into this trip, I like was well aware that like we might completely get skunked. We might be sitting in a tent for three weeks and not even get to go snowboarding. And we got there and the weather was just splitter. Like it was just perfect. So we were able to make it up to like 14 camp, which is like the third camp on your way up. You're towing these big sleds. You're probably towing like 130 pounds of gear up there with you. And you get up to 14 camp, and that's kind of like the base of all of these line, big lines that come down from the summit, sort of the cherry, really proud lines. And you, like, I like, I don't really like talking about certain things. Like, before I do them, I'm, like, kind of superstitious in that sense that, like, you sort of keep some hopes and dreams internalized. And I like to go on the mountains with high hopes but low expectations. And so, like, understanding that, kind of sets you up where like anything above that is a win 
And, uh, you know, we essentially were able to go up there and over time ride every major line on the mountain, which is like pretty unheard of, to be honest. If you're, you're lucky enough to, to just get one of them. And we probably rode like five of the main, main cherry lines on there, including like a couple new lines that had never, a few that had never been snowboarded. They had First descents, what they call. Yeah. <laughs> what do you call them in the streets? Well, well, NBDs. One, NBDs, yeah. yeah. NBDs. Yeah. Couple, Never been done. A couple NBDs. NBDs. First, yeah. first, first, first snowboard descents and then like first any like ski or snowboard. So it, it was pretty cool. Um, good crew, nine of us, which is like rolling deep, way deeper than you would on any other trip. But since it's like such a long period of time and like a, it's a much more social type thing um, than these more like tact- tactical strike missions. And so like the more good people you have around you, you're, you're just going to have a, a better experience. Killer. Were you the expert on that crew? Cause you know, Danny D Ian Walsh is a surfer, you know, like seems like you were kind of more of the expert in that crew. Um, I wouldn't call myself the expert, but I put the trip together. So like yeah. on paper, I was the expedition leader, but the we shrapenist. had, I mean, we had Jerry Mark. He, Jerry was the only other person that had been on the mountain. Jerry Mark, Harry Kearney, uh, Clark, Clark and Murph from the Teats. Uh, those two dudes, you know, have a shit ton of experience. Um, Forrest Shear was with us. Oh, yeah. Ledge. Yeah, yeah. He's had a crew, huh? Mega crew, dude. So that's why I like call it a dream trip. It's yeah. like, man, some of those things are just like super special. It might not ever happen, happen again. It's cool that we have it documented. It's really know? cool. It's called uh, The Big One. Recommend checking it out. Big one. We got to talk first to Senso because I think we should maybe change something. So... You know, like you said earlier, uh, we call them NBDs in the street. If you're the first person to hit some big ass kink rail, it's an NBD, never been done. But I think if you're the first person to hit a big ass kink rail, I think if it's a big, big one, how big does it have to be? Yeah, that's a first ascent. At least a triple. How many kinks? Triple? Yeah. Or just a monster. It's got to be a monster rail. Because a down bar, like a small rail, there's no. What about a monster down bar, though? Like Yeah, monster down bar, first ascent. I got a question. Like sextons. Yeah, it's a first ascent. That's a first ascent. How many stairs is like a, you know, legit number? Uh, I mean, for a big dog well, or snow, just the for, average rail? For a, big dog. a down rail? Mm, could have or a kink or rail. Whatever. So, like a kink rail, you probably, you know, in skating, you might skate like a five flat five. But in snowboarding, you would never, yeah, it would be too small. small. So, yeah. so I think that this is, we're getting into a gray area, but generally, like a solid kink rail is probably like a 25 flat 25 or 20, yeah. depending on the size of the stairs. Like 10 flat 10 is really small. Yeah, 10 flat 10. Maybe they're mm-hmm. long double stairs, you know, but Does also count? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to contradict myself and say, you know, if you have a, a new creative trick that mm-hmm. hasn't been mm-hmm. done, I don't think that the size matters if you're getting crafty. That's my, uh, that's my take, but not every, there is a lot of people that there's a legit, that's not legit to film on. That is, uh, I grew up with a different school of thought. And probably like the, the steepness of the rail comes into play, right? Yeah. Something you spent a lot of time thinking about, huh? Like handrails and stairs and stuff. <laughs> yeah, it kept me up last night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember on a trip way back in the day, like anything under a 20 stair that someone saw is like, no way, we're not shooting mm-hmm. that. Well, and that you guys is, would like small. walk them and count them? Nah, you could just kind of yeah. gauge. Eyeball it. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. can look at it and just be like, nope. Yeah, yeah, generally like a good down. No matter how dope your, your trick, no matter how dope the trick was, it's yeah. like that's it shrinks small. on camera, and you want it to look good. Yeah, we gotta. You know, it would be fun to do a little uh, like a skit where you split board up, and then maybe uh, a super long switch rail. over and first then descent. Dude, first I've hit, descent I've the rail. Hit some handrails. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's been a while. I would be split board, s- scared shitless. Split board on the rails would be gnarly. All those edges flying yeah, if you around. Caught that middle edge somehow. Ooh. I detune that sucker. Yeah, I would detune that thing. Yeah, probably. I would get one of those old uh, forum boards without the edges. Oh yeah, like Go one of those in a split board. board. Yeah, so, and you guys have street first de- street street dweller street dweller. Is that what the board was called? Yeah. You guys have first descents just for snowboards count for something? I thought I heard you mention that. Yeah, skiers I mean, went down at first. Yeah, I I mean I it's one of those that. things where like who the fuck really cares? Yeah, you know, um, the first ascent's a first ascent. Yeah, it doesn't matter if it was ski or snowboard, and that's yeah. kind of like yeah, like a you know top of the the kind of respect list, yeah. especially if it's like a big line, you know. Or but at the end of the day, who really cares? Yeah, 
Yeah. It's exciting, though, to have a first ascent. That's a cool thing. It's super exciting. Yeah, like, yeah just kind of going into the unknown yeah. is really the most exciting part about it. I what was it? able to get one in, in, on a heli trip, and it was pretty fun. Oh, Bud's got a first yeah. ascent. Yeah. Where? Oh, shit. Uh, it was in Canada on this... Who was I with? It was... Uh, I forget the name of the range. Did you name it? Yeah, it was called Imodium Ridge, because I had a little <laughs> bit of Rhea up at the top. <laughs> <laughs> It was Imodium good. Ridge. That was good times. We got to get a uh, plaque. Did you get to name I your first I think it was Land- Lando was let me have it. He was just like, hey, take this one. Did yeah, you that's name? that's the best part is naming it. And like, even if something's probably been written, like when we're at a zone, we always give them our own names, you know? But my favorite was in Bolivia. We called these things the Puma Spines because the the weather would come in in the afternoon from the Amazon and this like these thunder clouds would build like thunder and lightning and it kind of sounded like a puma's roar. And I remember we had I had posted something, whatever, Puma Spines, and this guy's like, If I if I wrote that, I'd probably Puma Pants. <laughs> the puma. <laughs> so it's like a double meeting. That's yeah. tight. That's yeah. fire. I like that guy, that guy. We gotta get that guy on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like a witty guy. He's only a good guy. Well, what about the fact that you guys you don't seem to dis- discriminate against skiers. There's a lot of skier snowboarders that don't cross pollinate. I seen you, you mm-hmm. know, out there with Cody Townsend, and and uh, you guys are two peas peas in a pod out there. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, we are doing the same shit. You know, I think I think there is a difference in like the jumping freestyle uh, ski snowboard thing, maybe. Maybe there's still like a little leftover tension from from the early days somehow, <laughs> but but when you're free riding, you know it is the same shit. You're getting up the mountain the same way. Maybe you're riding the line a little different way, but but ultimately we're doing the exact same thing, and we're all in it together. And like, you know, if you like, I, I have really great friends, really great mountain partners that are on skis. Like sometimes I'm the token. I'm oftentimes the token snowboarder. Um, because maybe like traditionally th- these skiers, there's they're just more of them doing that. I mean, it, it's definitely changing, but it it's kind of a cool position to be in where like can showcase the snowboarding culture to this ski community, especially with like Cody's projects and his his web series, the Fifty Project. That like I can be that token snowboarder and without being some like aggro dude and in tights slide slipping down a coulard mm-hmm. that like maybe some of these like bigger mountain lines traditionally have been ridden that like you can bring a little bit of you know core snowboardness to it good for you for making snowboarding look good to the uh, new new group of viewers however i still like uh i still like Making fun of snow uh, skiing, I just—it's just fun. It <laughs> skis uphill, you know. Yeah, you know, it's just I mean, like I love to. the old age old, yeah. like like light hearted. You gotta throw some you know, jabs. You gotta jab them. I love just a couple jabs. Like it's just, you, it, I don't think it should ever be like. I think there should always be a little bit of ball busting, and jabs <laughs> and shit talking. That's just how it needs just to be. Just for fun's sake. I agree. I think there needs to be a little healthy, healthy shit talking in there. All right, we're going to take a quick break and talk to you guys about GoPro. They got a new camera out. They got the Hero 11 Black Mini. It's got all kinds of technology, like one-button simplicity with quick capture and voice control. It shoots the best video settings with the push of a button, just point and shoot, buds. Yeah, now it has the new mounting options with two sets of folding fingers and a much more low-profile mounting setup. It's also got revolutionary tall 8x7 sensor built for social media sharing if you want to shoot those vertical GoPro vids. The GoPro 11 is Emmy award winning which is pretty amazing. Hashtag hypersmooth 5.0 stabilization. It's got the new Hyperview digital lens. It also has a built-in Enduro battery technology which is going to last extra long in those cold temps. Be sure to check out the GoPro 11 Black Mini and also, don't forget to tag at GoPro if you shoot any footage with those guys. Okay, we're going to take a quick break and talk to you guys about the style experience, buds. Canada Snowboard is revolutionizing the big air game with their newest event, the style experience, with an integrated style contest component 
that is the perfect combination of progressive and timeless tricks, Chris. Yep. That one is going to keep the revs high, buds. Watch the best snowboarders in the world chuck carcass at the largest big air contest Canada has ever seen in the winter stronghold of Edmonton, Alberta. It's going down in the Commonwealth Stadium, boasting VIP suite options, private bars, heated tents, a vendor village, and more. Fire this one up on the evening of December 10th, Canada. The style experience is made possible through the partnership between Canada Snowboard and Explore Edmonton presented by Toyota. Get on your most stylish winter gear and secure a spot at the winter event of the year on Ticketmaster. All right, Nick, I have a question for you. Thinking about big mountain snowboarders, uh, a lot of them um, that ride the lines that you do do it via helicopter or do it via snowmobile. But I was kind of wondering, are you the first professional split boarder that's pretty much accessed all of these via hiking? You know, I, I'm not really sure on uh, the exact definition on that, but... When I was getting into it, there definitely was not an avenue for it's like in the pro snowboarding realm to be like you know basically like strictly uh, splitboarding. You know, it was people that were filming free ride parts were doing it with helis and sleds, and it wasn't until Jeremy came along and kind of paved the way for that to be a thing. You know, getting on Jones was a big catalyst for me to give me like my first real like big sponsor and being able to learn from him uh, in the mountains and then kind of like negotiating life as we sort of talked about before was definitely a stepping stone for that. And to be honest, it wasn't until a couple of years ago that like I'd really call myself a professional. Um, I was always like, when people ask, what do you do? I say, I'm a snowboarder, because that's what we identify as. He's not going to be like, oh, I, uh, I'm a landscaper, or uh, I trim weed. You know, that's, that's not what you do. That's not who you are. And so I was always working these uh, jobs, obviously, like many of us do in the summertime to pay the bills and, you know, basically just stack up money for the winter to be able to, like, take a few months off from December to April and, you know, basically have no social life. You're, you're working seven days a week as much as you can, double shifts, triple shifts, whatever you can do to stack money. And I remember when I was living out here in Salt Lake, I had a couple different, like, restaurant jobs. Um, first job out here was the Olive Garden as a Shout server. <laughs> respect. Shout out to the tour of Italy. That's one of yeah. my favorites. Keep going. <laughs> the worst place to work and be a server because you get tipped, obviously, of, like, what the bill is and – at a place that has unlimited soup and salad and breadsticks and all that, you're like people some, are loading up. Someone will sit at your table for like four hours and their bill's like seven bucks. Oof. So you're like, oh, damn, those breadsticks are good though. They are, and I remember having this memory of working there. And uh, Scott Stevens came in with with the boys, and um, I just remember having being like, oh man, I can't wait till I can like go out to a restaurant and be. A, Pro snowboarder, you know, <laughs> thinking that like Olive Garden's balling, <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, then like Spadelli's Park Cafe, like major shout out to to Sean Miller and to Mac and Sam Spadale for giving me a job and letting me take off when I needed to, and always having a place for me when I came back in the springtime. And then yeah, it wasn't really until like a couple of years ago that everything started falling into place with me with. First Patagonia, then Red Bull. Um, shout out to those guys. Thank you. And I think that's like kind of a testament to the longevity in this arena where it is an older man's game, you know, in the in the trickery world, you're, you know, kind of phasing out late 20s. And I didn't get my first real contract until almost 30 years old. You know, I think that's pretty rare in our world, you know. And so that definitely gave me uh, this unexpected boost in confidence where I always knew from the beginning that, like, snowboarding was it for me. There was nothing else. There's no plan B. I lost my keys to the getaway car well before I had a driver's license, you know, like from fucking 12 years old onward. It was like, I'm going to snowboard. And at first it was, I'm going to 
do the U.S. Open and X Games and then the Olympics. I'm, that's what I'm going to do. And then, like, in the high school, quickly realized I, like, wasn't that good at it. A lot of my friends were really good at it. And having a shit ton of, like, legit success by the time we were graduated high school. Like, Luke Matrani bought a fucking house at 13 years old. <laughs> 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 like, come on. Respect. Yeah, serious respect. Yeah. And so, like, we'd all go out there. Like, I would go out. Those guys moved out. They stopped going to school, basically, in high school. And I would go out there spring break, and we would live at the Matranis and, and Mammoth and have huge parties. And the floor caved in one time. There were so many people in the Jeez. house, like, legitimately collapsed. But it was weird being around that much success at a young age and, like, as a peer, you know, trying to – compare yourself to that it was not like a healthy mindset for a young kid i don't think like the competitive route is a very healthy mindset for kids that young you know your your success is based like your worth is based off of your success in competitions how well you do and if you're not doing that well you're not successful and so like that can take a hit on your on your ego like pretty gnarly you know and it wasn't really until you know, the end of high school where I started to phase out of it, where I sort of realized I'm not that competitive and I don't like the structure of it all. Like I didn't want someone telling me like that what I did was good or not. Like snowboarding is supposed to be this subjective freedom of creativity, you know, and then all of a sudden what you're doing isn't good enough. And that's, you know, kind of was like the start of my transition out of it I would still do events like uh uh like the Cinco de Pipo and go to Super Park and and that kind of stuff but I wasn't like it was more just like a you know a scene thing like I could stay in the mix get a photo here and there but but like nothing was really clicking for me you know and through like the given movies it was like oh I'm gonna be like backcountry dude I want to be like Jake Blavelt and Nicholas Mueller like this is what I want to do I think those dudes are the shit. And I remember we were at Mount Baker building this jump. Uh, grandma's is like a classic jump across from Mount Hermon there. Great jump. Great jump, but it's a fucking jump that's been built for like 20 years, you know. And we're building this thing and I'm like breaking my back trying to make blocks. And it's like perfect bluebird pow day. And I'm seeing people skin by below going up to Mount Hermon there. And I'm like just had this realization i'm like what am i gonna do like a back seven on this jump that noah slaznik did better 25 years ago anyways <laughs> and like i'm just trying to like check these boxes of tricks that i need in a video part because some like non-existent governing body tells you that this is what has to be in a video part you know You're like okay you need the backside trick you need the cab you need blah 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 and i felt like i was falling into sort of like the same thing that like had this structure and people telling you what you needed to do, even if it was unspoken, you know? And I was like seeing these people walk by and I'm like seeing people get like a couple laps on Mount Hermon. I'm like, that looks so fucking fun right now. I want to go and do that. And I think that next year I got a split board. And by the end of that season that we were filming for two, Wyatt and I had already started filming each other with his 16 mil camera, just like running gun style. We trade off every other lap at Baker and just like carrying the 16 like a full machine gun, you know? And that was sort of the start of our saga into making free our like four year project. Just awesome project. Everybody should watch if they haven't. Thank you. A uh, lot of cool stuff you breezed over there. I love, uh, you know, f I got to commend you for following whatever it was, your intuition that told you that, okay, everybody does it this way. I feel like there's another way. And I think a lot of people that sit in that chair that we've talked to have been pioneers in thinking outside the box. But I love that that unofficial governing body, you know, in our world of the trick world. It's so such an interesting thing because there's, there's like, you know, there's two paths really in freestyle snowboarding where you either compete and, and hope to do well there. Mm -hmm. Or you film a video part, and, and within that video part, there are these unspoken rules and regulations. Well, you need X amount of cheese wedges. You know, you need your jump tricks. You need your variety. You know, handrails. They Like, how big is the rail the right size? Like, is that a cool rail? Oh, that rail's not cool for this reason. We only do things a certain way. And um, 
I just love like how you how you broke that mold and and did it your own and and not to say that people haven't splitboarded you know you got Dave Downing you got all kinds of pioneers of splitboarding but to to kind of exclusively splitboard and and build a career on it, it's just fucking awesome and to have that realization that yeah. like I'm not as good as some of these guys and what am I doing Noah Slaznik did that 20 years ago that's so cool to make that decision totally dude. splitboard create your own lane yeah and then. Like, as we were kind of doing this whole free project, hanging with Wyatt specifically, I had sort of kind of ruled out ever the possibility of making a living off of snowboarding. It was like, we could wash windows all summer. I'd live at his house, work with him and his brother and his dad. We'd wash windows and, you know, we'd make five to eight grand. I would put it in a shoebox under my bed and I wouldn't count it until the fall. And then, like, come Thanksgiving, I'd bust that shoebox out and, and count it. And I'm like, oh, shit, dude, I got $5,000. I don't have to work for, like, however many months. You know, if we live super cheap, we go to Costco, we buy a bunch of bagels. Like, we're good, dude. <laughs> and we were just living super cheap and frugal. And I was like, I was like one of those things, like, you get there by realizing you're already there. Like, we're doing it. We're going snowboarding every single day in the winter. This is incredible. Mm-hmm. And, like, we don't have to answer to nobody. Like, hence the name Free. And uh, then it wasn't until really moving to Tahoe, getting involved with Jones and like sort of this transition and things sort of started to pick up. Um, Maybe as like the popularity started to pick up like in the mainstream and, you know, thanks to Jer and and obviously and thanks to like Zellers, Tom Burt, Downing, John Greiber, Stephen Koch, all these dudes that set the boot pack for people like myself to follow. Because that's the thing you need to remember is like none of us would be here without the people that came before us to set the bar. And like the best we can do is try to like match that and do whatever we can to try to like push the needle a little bit more in one way or another. And, you know, so whether that's in the part realm or, you know, going to a new mountain range, new line, what it may be that, like I said, that form of progression comes in different ways. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier, being, you know, uh, kind of a simple life's a good life, or in other words, just like focus on what you're good at and don't try to do everything. Like that's, that's like great. You're like, Mm -hmm. You know, you it's so hard to not get distracted and want to do everything and want to hit the park jumps and want to hit that and mm-hmm. want to do the bank slums and do everything. But like when when you really, you know, I, I read this minimalist book and the whole uh, the, the tagline of the book is the disciplined pursuit of less but better. Again, I'm going to say that again, the disciplined pursuit of less but better. And, it, and it, that's what you you did. And uh, it, it paid out for you, and now you got a goddamn Red Bull hat on. Yeah, Let's fucking go. I was just go. gonna say that, yeah. <laughs> dude. Red Bull gives you wings, son, to get up that hill. Dude, if you would have asked me five years ago if I would ever be wearing a Red Bull hat, I would say like, yeah, right. Like, why would they want to work with me? You know. And then it was the catalyst to that was that Denali trip with Ian, because Ian's been on Red Bull for fucking fifteen years. So talking to him and, you know, the wheels get spinning, you know, you want to be as good as you can, you know, you want to take your shit to the next level. Cause if you're not, what are you doing? Like you're, you're wasting other people's time. You're wasting your time. And so like stagnation is, is, you know, very bad thing. I think that's, you know, you get lazy and whatever, but meeting Ian and kind of the dots started getting connected there. And it was like multi-year process, um, for that all to line up and super psyched and grateful. It's been a really cool experience the past couple of years, two years, really. It all went down during COVID and that has definitely, you know, been a major, uh, leap for me in my career. Totally. And they got the gym. You go out there to the meat factory or chucking weights with all the other athletes. <laughs> the meat factory. And, uh, dude, it's inspiring going to that spot. Like mm-hmm. you're seeing all these other dudes that are top dogs of their sport and, you definitely feel, I don't want to call it a pressure, but you feel like a fire lit. You're like, damn, I want to send it right now. Yeah. Gonna, I want to be in best shape as I can to be able to perform the best that I can. You're in good company with other people wearing that hat. You know, it's definitely, uh, a, they, they put on people that are, are very, they have a lot of merits in their, in their field. Um, I got a qu- hypothetical question for you. So you're, you're diehard split boarder, right? Okay, I split board, you know, do, doesn't take snowmobiles. Rarely takes helicopters, and if he does, he split boards to the top of the mountain. 
T. Ricky, Travis Rice calls you. He's like, hey, Nick, it's Travis <laughs> working on a project. <laughs> Working on a project. It's gonna be it's gonna be the new art of flight. Want you in there. No split boards though. We're dropping you off on the peak. Are you saying yes or are you saying nah dog? That ain't for me. I would say he would throw in a few more words that you can't really understand. Yeah. <laughs> Cow is fat, time to slaughter. Okay. You're like, what does that mean? Cow is fat, is that what he said? Yeah, that's right before you Yeah. Um you know, I don't think I would do that. I've been in helicopters. Um, and I've been on snowmobiles and I've learned that I don't really operate that well in that environment. It's a little too fast paced for me, especially helicopters, dude. If you know, you guys know that it's very high stress dollars are being burned and you get to a zone. Okay. What's your line? Okay, cool. Get in the heli, take a picture. Let's go. Okay. Now you're on top and you can't see anything. Okay, let's go. Life's good. Like we're ready. Three, two, one drop. And it's fucking stressful, dude. And you don't have a feel for the snow. You know, by climbing up a line, you know exactly what the snow is like. You know what that apron is going to be like. So that's going to tell you if you can mob out of a line. And you know what the choke is going to be like, if there's like a bit of ice, whatever, some weird funky snow in there. And like, just for me personally, like climbing a line gives me a lot more confidence in the snowpack and also like how I'm going to ride a line. And the opportunities that I've had to go in a helicopter, which has been like pretty few, but it's happened. And I'm just not as confident in my riding and it shows when you're riding scared dude it shows you know you can tell in that clip especially like especially when you're filming you know you're like scared coming over that blind roll you're maybe you know making a few more turns or like you stop like the worst thing that you could do Ruin while filming the shot. yeah the shot's done <laughs> right and just doing it on foot gives me a much more intimate view of the line so like i appreciate the offer travis but uh, I'm going to have to lure you in <laughs> to... You just said no to Team Ricky. I'm going to lure him in. We've actually been talking about doing a, a foot power trip. The Art of Skins? The Art of Skins, yeah. The meat helicopter of flight? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's not a good name. Um, all right, we're going to take a quick break and talk to you guys about some socks. Jed Anderson rides them, Jill Perkins ride them, and I ride them. Of course, you know I'm talking about Stance. If you've ever seen a pair of socks with the Icon logo on the ankle, then you know about Stance. Stance has been making some of the most comfortable and creatively designed socks and underwear for the snowboarding community for a while. They also make Celtics, Boston Red Sox gear. I got all kinds of collaborative gear from them. But lately, their designers have been bringing in the same winning formula to clothing. We're talking joggers, hoodies, hats, and tees. They even got a Wu-Tang collab. Things kind of fire. Toe-to-head comfort and creativity. Head on over to stance.com and use promo code THEBOMBHOLE to save 20% off. Again, stance.com, promo code THEBOMBHOLE. Hey, Nick, have you, uh, have you heard of the, the guy who's been everywhere and done everything? No. His name's Bindare Dundat. <laughs> Bindare Dundat. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, what, what were you saying? Uh, <laughs> Something about the more you go, uh, the yeah, less so, you know? Well, so yeah, the so more if, you see, the less you know? If this guy's been there, done, done all that. <laughs> been there, you, done that. They also say the more you see, the less you know. So I wonder how much you retain from all that. Mm-hmm. They also say if you don't use it, you lose it. <laughs> as we've touched so it. I read. <laughs> what, what else do they say? Uh, well, who's they? <laughs> Uh, Who they is, is the they is a vague term. Uh, they are the governing body that tells <laughs> you if you need body. a cap nine in your video part. <laughs> Who are these mysterious bodies of people that govern? <clears throat> you know what they also say, buds? What do they say? Grab tail checks in the mail. I, I was gonna, I was gonna go there too. <laughs> they also say slow is fast, fast. Or sorry, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. But then they also say if you're at the Baker Banked or the Dirksen Derby, slow is just slow. Yeah, it's it's not a thing. They also say, "Go fast, take chances. You can't get hurt in the air." Close your have eyes, you ever, lean back. Have mm-hmm. you ever heard Charlotte Bob be like, "You know what they say," and then he just ends it. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't say anything. <laughs> I I heard a really good Shaneism a while ago. It was like uh, along the lines of, "I have no idea where we're going." but we're making great time. Mm -hmm. And I've taken that with me in my life on this path. 
you know. Yep. That's a good one. Uh, if you don't say? know where you're He's, going, you'll probably end up there. Too. You're going to get there. Yeah. You know what he always says, too, is uh, never on schedule, always on time. Mm-hmm. That's a Shaneism. Where's he come up with these great Shane-isms? He's basically a Zen voodoo Zen monk Buddha in another monk. life. Yeah. All right, we're really fucking derailing here with these uh, these sayings. <laughs> so I want to get into uh, talking about, you know, you've done Denali, Denali, whatever, however you say it. Fuck my cat and have it yet. Uh, <laughs> Turkey, you know, you were ridden some wooden sticks. I can't talk. Uh, Antarctica. You, you're, this guy's just been bagging peaks first to Ben there done that. Yada, 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 yada. Some call me Ben. Yeah. yeah a lot of sure. people call yeah. him Ben. Ben, ben Nicholas Cage, done that. <laughs> I don't know. I'm losing my mind. Anyway, so what's your favorite? Uh, what, what's the most notable hog of a peak that you've bagged that you want to talk about? There's some big dog hogs out there that are on the list there is a long black book for sure but like i gotta say our range of mystery bolivia expedition 2018 was most memorable for sure man me danny gray thompson murph and uh photographer justin kios went out there and that was you know, a seed planted from spending a lot of time in Chile over the years and kind of just getting curious about new places to go. Uh, started looking into Bolivia, into the Cordillera Real, uh, the main mountain range out of La Paz there, talking with Jones about it. He was like, oh, you got to talk to Jim Zellers. Jim's been there. He has the beta. And when you're going to these like pretty remote places, you take any amount of information you can get. And so I'm you know, I texted Zellers. It was like my f- first year living in Tahoe. So I didn't really know him that well. Just knew he was a ledge. And he texted me back and I was like, yeah, come over to my house. I'll sh- tell you everything I know. And so I go to his house. He has this uh, basement that's like bat cave of knowledge and just like insane photos from the 90s. And for those that don't know, Jim Zellers and Tom Burt were the original big mountain exploratory snowboarders um first descent of denali of the orient express pomori in nepal mount cook in new zealand and tom kind of went the standard films route and so he's probably more known in the world because he has like a lot of video parts and whatnot and zellers kind of didn't maybe get the shine in today's world per se, because like he didn't film a lot. He did a lot of photo trips because those expeditions back in the day, it's like so hard to film that shit, especially when they were shooting on, on film. But they, those guys went there 20 years ago, like 99, I think over 20 years ago. And turns out like the area that I was looking at was a completely different mountain range. He's like, that's cool. But where you want to go is the Apollo Bomba which is this mountain range, eight hours to the north on the border of Peru. Those guys are the first people to go there, first and I'm like only people to go there. And so he basically gave me all of his information, told me where they went. And so I sort of wanted to pick up where they, lo- they left off and go to the northern reaches of the range where they hadn't been into. And there was this peak called Chapiorco. So that sort of became the focal point of the expedition. And this was really... My first expedition to a like legit remote area with minimal information, no maps, just full raw dog out there and like true adventure. You know, there's not too many places left like that on the earth. And I wrangled Danny in somehow. I had to book him in, book him like a year in advance because he's a busy guy. Gray and I had been riding a lot together and we all went out there spring of 2018 and just full adventure man like you know you get to this town Pelichuco that you're going on these like bumpy dirt roads on four by four by four deals you get to this town you need to figure out how you're going to get into the mountains we had gone there initially thinking I was going to need to find a mule driver to get us into the mountains and so I'm kind of looking around but had learned that there had recently been built mining roads four by four roads but you needed like a pretty good truck to get in there And so it's this town square, you know, the size of the parking lot out front, basically. And I see this one red truck, four by four truck. 
And so I like am walking around and I'm going to like old Cholita women. I'm like, uh, para mi so, uh, es tu coche? Like, is this your car? I have very broken Spanish. And they're like, no, no, no. And was telling me, no, this isn't my car. This isn't my car. And so I sat down on the sidewalk for like two hours next to this truck. And I'm like, just like waiting for somebody to walk up to it. And this kid comes walking up and I'm like, ah, I was like, it's your truck. And he's like, see, sí, it's me too, my uncle's. And I'm like, ah, um, like, sabes, Chapiorco? Like, or whatever the lake was. I'm like, you know this lake? He's like, no. And I'm like, show him on the map. And I'm like, uh, yo quiero una viajar. Uh, yeah, like, we want to go there. And so he's like, okay. And so he hooks us up with his uncle. And uh, I know enough Spanish to know how bad at Spanish I am. So like what I sound like, you know? And I'm like, uh, is your car, we want travel? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so we get into the mountains. These guys drop us off. We had three weeks worth of supplies and food, and we just figured it out, man. Like we had these very rudimentary maps, like basically a hand drawn map, and you know we got caught in a lightning storm on the mountain. Gray got fucking struck by lightning. What? <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> like, like zapped. zapped. Like he didn't get like fully struck, but he's wearing a GoPro and there's a shot of it and you can hear it in the in the clip. Like you can hear this. And he's like, oh my God. Wow. And so it was pretty heavy. And that was like one of the top three heaviest experiences I've ever had in my life, getting stuck in a lightning storm. Uh, at 19,000 yeah, feet elevation. on like, a glacier like too. Yeah. Like we're crouched down. We're standing on ropes. We ditched ourselves of all metal and like head down in lightning position. I'm like, I had accounted for every hazard that one may, uh, <laughs> you know, experience, experience in, in the big mountains and, you know, avalanches, crevasses, altitude sickness, like food, getting food sickness, whatever. But I didn't think about getting sh fucking struck by lightning. <laughs> And uh, so you're counting from the thunder to the lightning strike, right? And so if it's like, I, I can't remember the exact ratio, but it's like three seconds is like, it's like a mile away, something like that. And these were instantaneous thunder and lightning. Like it was right on top of us. And there's nowhere to go at this point. So we're, I'm like, oh, this is it. How'd Nick die? Lightning storm, Bolivia, 19,000 feet. It's a respectable way to go, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, like I, I you was. You guys are all going no metal though, and homie's got the GoPro. <laughs> <laughs> dude, for <laughs> sure, dude. Lightning. Well, the thing on the glacier like is like rod. you're wearing these harnesses. You're covered in fucking carabiners and ice screws. Yeah. You're holding two ice axes. Yeah. And like, yeah, we get down onto the flat. We just like chuck everything. You're holding your board. It's like everything's ringing, dude. It's like really crazy. You hear vibrating on. Huh? Oh, fully. Yeah, and you just, just charged. Ditch everything, all rules of glacier travel go out the window. We had been roped up that morning going across this glacier, and now we're just like scattering. Like, <laughs> where the fuck are you? Too close where together. are you going? <laughs> yeah. You know, there's nowhere to go. I like see a rock in the distance, and I start like running towards it, and then kind of a few seconds in, realize that the rock is like three miles away, you know? <laughs> oh, geez. And I'm just like, whoa, do we jump in a crevasse? <laughs> and. Yeah, like, what's protocol? Well, so, yeah, strip yourself of metal, lightning position. So, like, we, like, stood on ropes. That's What's lightning you, position? Like, you want to crouch down, basically, and stand on something uh, non... Conductive. Uh, conductive, that's the word. Thank you. And so, like, ropes, backpack, whatever. Um, and basically just wait it out. There's not much you can do. In hindsight, I would have taken a probe out and put that maybe, like, 10, 20 feet away from us. And, and, and that would be the rod. Totally. Pro tip. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the pro tip. I would have done that. But uh, I just remember thinking, I was like thinking about the other guys. I was like, how how am I gonna tell these, you know, like girlfriends and parents that like, because this whole trip was my idea, mm. and like Danny especially. And I'm like, how am I gonna tell Danny's parents that he fucking got struck by lightning? <laughs> you know, it's kind of heavy. And uh, eventually, the the dis the time between the thunder and lightning starts spreading out. It's far enough away. We're like, okay, go. You know, we go over the call, we get back down into the rocks, and it was all good. And we get down there, and, you know, Danny and I and Murph are just like, that was crazy! <laughs> <laughs> you know? And, like, yeah, we were a little shook for sure. Went back down all the way to base camp, kind of, like, collected ourselves for a day or two. And, you know, eventually we went back up, and uh, and we got the line. And um, Chao Piorco is, like, the highest I had ever been at the time. Any of us had How many ever been feet? at the time. Uh, almost 20 chow. Um, so it was... Chow's in. Yeah. Chow's in, yeah. A lot of chow. Oof. Yeah. 
And it was a cool experience, man. It was like a full um, validation of like your skills and your hopes and dreams. And like you want to do this big shit in the mountains. And like it's pretty easy to to get shut down or to like fucking get yourself killed out there, you know. And for it to line up like that was was really special and like a major landmark for me that kind of gave me a little bit of confidence. I was like, okay, maybe I am on to something here, you know. And then the next day we had these spines in the distance and we got on these spines that ended up being way sicker. And it fully just came together full circle, 11th hour. And that's kind of how that shit goes sometimes. Like you're getting beat down. You don't think it's going to happen. You're going through every emotion possible, right? You're like, what are we doing here? Are we in over our heads? And if you're patient enough, if you're optimistic enough and like put in the time, you know, it can work out. And just thinking about the amount of planning of travel and Mm. where to go and how to get there and getting everyone all the gear it's it's a lot of gear dude, you job, don't even dude. know how you're gonna get there if, without that truck that's crazy no dude just like on a whim it's like okay first step is showing up with any yeah. of this. first like, yeah that's a shanism too yeah i got a cool. shalpinism question for you mm-hmm. so this is we talked about this in michelle's parker's episode and i actually have confirmation that um so i went and raced the motocross race at mammoth which for a lot of people that live at sea level is a very high elevation race uh and it's it really affects the fitness levels. The the elevation affects fitness levels. Everybody knows that. But what some racers do is they actually take Viagra. I have confirmation that some of the racers at Mammoth wow. took Viagra uh, in order to increase blood flow while racing their dirt bike. Do you do that on high mountains? Did do you guys have, all pop a bunch of Viagra were when they you're in Bolivia? Erect. I, yeah. How I does actually, that work? I don't. I can get more inside info and ask. Uh, but I I'll, I will ask my buddy that raced that took Viagra and see. But I wonder I, if like you're so jacked up on adrenaline that it doesn't it bypasses go I, to your dong. I think it could be the case on yeah. a dirt bike at least. But maybe after you get off of it, you're like just like hunched over with an awkward <laughs> boner. If you win, you can't go podium. <laughs> <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> you're all hunched over. You need a little like band tuck, <laughs> boner you know? tuck, classic move. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. about band tuck. No, I can't say I've ever done it. But okay, maybe. Wow. Yeah. Maybe we should look into that, bud. Selling that along a little, a little uh, pack. We got some run through a wall smelling salts and some Viagra. Some You're Viagra. ready to go into the mountains. <laughs> yeah, we need to get some more intel on that. But yes. I think it might be a pro tip because you replace your ice axe with your hard on. <laughs> <laughs> your toe side turn. I need a Viagra instead of a hand drag. You're just dong drag. <laughs> See that mark? That but is that's not a, a hand drag. That is a weird track. <laughs> It's not in the normal position as the hand drag. <laughs> yeah, a whole other extremity to keep you Ooh. locked into the mountain. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, good stuff. Um, Buds, I think we got a Patreon question that allots to um, the snowboard sitting behind him. Yes. All and right. First of all, I do want to say thank yeah. you to our Patreon members. We really appreciate you guys supporting our show. And we're currently working on making a little bit better experience for you. And we we appreciate you guys and we love you guys. All right. This is from Johnny B. Photo. How has the transition from Jones to Wonder Alpine afforded opportunities to grow your presence in the backcountry and snowboarding as a whole? What is your vision for the future of snowboarding? That's a big question. But with uh, the transition from Jones to Wonder, it was a big step for me. It was a big leap. Uh, You know, Jones is synonymous. Jones Snowboards and the human is synonymous with split boarding and free riding. And so, like, you know, no surprise that they make the best gear. Uh, And those guys have given me a life in the mountains. Like, 100%, I owe a lot to Jeremy and the crew there. And... I was riding for them for like about seven years, probably my my longest sponsor, and that's a really tough thing to leave. You know, um, I do value loyalty, and you build a family around these brands, and especially being based in Truckee, the whole crew is there, like the town that I live in. And when the opportunity for Wonder came up, you know, it definitely got me thinking of you know what a life. Uh, away from Jones would look like and definitely pondered the idea for a while before I was really 
taking it seriously. And, uh, you know, thanks to Pep and Alex for kind of making the transition a bit easier, but basically had an opportunity to, to help come in and, and help develop some snowboards with Wonder Alpine. And it's been a, you know, really incredible learning experience th this past year uh, in terms of board construction. And I mean, for those that don't know, we are part of a biotech company called Checker Spot based out of Alameda. And so much of the materials in the board are made from like biotechnology, uh, basically um, this algal tech is what they call it. And so they've mm -hmm. been able to create like polyurethanes made from microalgae, so non-petroleum based plastic, which is incredibly toxic for the environment and goes into every ski and snowboard. And so there's a lot of waste. And these guys have basically created this concoction that we can put into the boards. It's primarily the sidewalls and some of the core construction that's inlaid with the Aspen wood cores that is petroleum free, which is super fucking cool. And that was, you know, the main selling point that, that brought me over there, you know, this environmentally friendly new technology in boards that's never been seen before. And, you know, having the ability to be on the front end of the development of this is like a really unique once in a lifetime opportunity. So I've been learning a ton, like getting my mind blown going to the material sciences lab, the molecular foundry in Alameda. And I mean, full scientists out there, you know, and they're figuring out the rigidity and dampness of these materials and how they work in the boards and skis. And they work great, dude. I've, I've been on the board. We've been prototyping the past year. We're coming out with this board behind me right now called the Bell Tour. We've got a split board and a solid board that's the same shape, uh, Bell Tour and Bell Air, and it's really exciting and and really hoping to, you know, help uh, help the rest of the snow industry adopt this technology. We're not trying to like keep it secret or anything like that. Like we want people to remove themselves from petroleum and reducing excess waste because like building snowboards and skis is like pretty toxic to the environment it's not a very good thing which is very hypocritical for our our path in this life you know we need to reduce carbon emissions drastically and so any little amount that we can reduce that is amazing to me i think there are super cool brands that are doing rad things i think capita is doing super cool shit with with their factory jones obviously top of the board Burton, uh, Donna is like super prominent member of Protect Our Winners. And it was just a cool opportunity to get involved with, with a brand from the ground floor and like help design snowboards that has always been a dream of mine. There, there's also a, a key ingredient that kind of you didn't mention, and I think it's important for the listeners to know, is that the factory for Wonder Alpine is based out of Salt Lake City right here. So the, mm -hmm. the boards are made a couple miles down the road. And it's made by a bunch of my friends, actually, and um, I think that's a cool that's that's a cool deal too. The fact that it's made right here, right down the street, and that goes that goes a lot into the whole um, just like the ethos of the brand, American made, like Lib Tech. You know, yeah. there are brands doing cool shit, but um, yeah, to just be involved in something new is, is really special and exciting. And I've been learning a lot. I have a quick second part. Um, well, thanks, JB, for that question. He's a good yeah, homie. Yeah, thank you. But also, Johan said there was rumors you had offers from a bigger brand <laughs> as well. Oh, well, we have a bidding war? Do you yeah, have a bidding was there war? a bidding war? What's, what's, the, what's the deal wow. with that? And are those all the reasons you chose Wonder over this other offer? There, <laughs> there was. Uh, I'd been talking to some other people, like kind of like law of attraction. I don't know really what you'd call you know, it. Once somebody wants you, it's yeah. like the word gets out. Splitboarding's hot right now. It's so like when, hot right now. Like when you're single and you like really want a girlfriend and then you get a girlfriend. Then there's three. And the, no, not, not that, <laughs> but like then all of a sudden like girls are looking at you. Yeah. Shout out to my lovely girlfriend, Rachel, by the way. Yeah, when you're married, all of a sudden girls are like, oh, this guy's marriage material. You know? <laughs> uh, super hot. <laughs> the applause, the super air horn. That's yeah. for the lady. The old That's significant other. No, they're... they're there were some some other options, and um, 
none of that's ever an easy decision. You know, it's like leaving Jones was not an easy decision at all. I didn't have any reason to. I was psyched. Like, I was honored to be involved with the brand for as long as I was. Jeremy is a close friend, uh, you know, as is everyone else at the brand. And having that conversation was straight up hardest decision I've made in my life. I'm a very non-confrontational person and, uh, you know, had tears in my eyes talking to him about it. And, you know, I have like infinite respect for Jeremy and kind of ran it by him before I, I, I didn't make any decisions, you know, I'm like, Hey, this is on the table. And, um, just a unique opportunity to like really design snowboards that I was super psyched on and and to have that ability to start shaping boards and see how it's done has always been a dream of mine you know we spend so much time on these pieces of wood why not figure out what's in them and how to make them ride the way we want them to ride i'd like to get sponsored by that those guys over in turkey oh yeah get yeah. one of the get what, one of, what, are they what were you calling those patron boards the patron. i want to get a patron so, sponsor not the, patron Patron. Yeah, well, Patron, Patron also might cool not too. be bad. Maybe a collab. Yeah, just become could, a raging alcoholic, just like chugging Patron, tequila Patron. in the booth. That'd be great. Yeah. Uh, question, though, going back to the original Patreon, there was a question, a hard-hitting... Uh, Snowboarding one. ...question that was... Uh, the second part of, of the earlier what? question was, what was the future... What, what was, is your vision for the future of snowboarding? You know, I... Um, it's kind of baffling to me that more riders and brands aren't more vocal about climate change solutions. Mm -hmm. We are, I mean, on like a selfish level, we are so dependent on snow. That is our livelihood. That is our passion. That what's, that's what brings us life and purpose. And without that, what, like, what are we like? We don't have the. We're going to talk about the old days back when it used to snow, you know. And we're on that path. Like it's inevitable, you know. But how can we mitigate those effects the best we can? And so, being involved with brands that do keep that as the top priority is uh, really important to me. And it's great to see other brands stepping up to the plate because none of us have have a livelihood if it stops snowing, you know. And people seem to forget about that, you know. And and these companies are pretty focused on like short term gains. And I think that's just our society in general. It's like focused on these like short term stock bumps and whatnot. But like, what are you going to think about in 30 years, man, when the climate's just completely fucked? It goes so much further beyond it not snowing and us not having powder days. I mean, what was the article that came out a couple months ago about the Salt Lake reaching critically low levels? And, yeah, and if it gets lower, there's going to be there. like a toxic dust storm that's going to wipe everybody out. You know, like what are these, what's our plan here? So like Patagonia recently just came out. They're donating all profits of Patagonia to basically this trust into fighting climate change in one way or, or another. And you know, with riders that don't, we don't all need to have a megaphone and be screaming at the top of our lungs, leading the march down the street, you know, but it, like, it should be at like, uh, the top of discussion topics, you know, as like what you can do as an individual. And I mean, we don't all need to be scientists either. I think that, uh, I was told once that how much you care is a lot more important than how much you know. You don't need to know all the stats and figures and you don't need to like preach shit, but like it should come up, you know, like I feel like it should come up more on this show with people and, and with brands. And so it's like, I do appreciate the brands that have that as a, you know, primary focus of, of their like business plan, because without that, man, like we're, we're heading in a really rough direction and it's not pretty, the outlooks. And so, yeah, I think those are really uh, well spoken words. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> recently, I heard a term that I thought was really powerful. And it might be Pow's mantra or something, but it was something along the lines of uh, imperfect activism, maybe mm -hmm. something like that. And that really spoke to me because, you know, on this show, right? Like, you know, if I'm, if we're, like, we, we have an audience and people listen for sure, 
But I feel like a fraud in some ways because I enjoy certain things like mo- I, I ride dirt bikes, right? So it's like I feel like a hypocrite or, you know, if I ride a snowmobile, I feel like a hypocrite in some ways. So it's like I don't and, and that there's like definitely a lot of toxic finger pointing that happens on the internet of like which is bullshit which is yeah bullshit so i think the idea of imperfect activism where it's like hey do your part where you can you know um is definitely a a cool way to do it as opposed to like just like you're bad you're bad you're bad right i I think that's that's um a, a great like focus on what what is are good things you can do than what than just bad i guess maybe i couldn't agree more yeah. and just because you ride a sled or fly in helis a 10 days a year it doesn't mean you can't care about the environment yes you know like it doesn't mean that you have to feel hypocritical like that and you shouldn't because like clearly you do you know and it like i said it's so much beyond powder days and, and, and having so the trickle down effects are drastic and we're seeing them in real time we're like seeing these fucking apocalyptic movies play out real time on the news every other day like flooding in Pakistan the hurricane in Florida droughts in the west wildfires like it's happening right now man so on a, on a what, what are some act, what's some actionable advice for people that want to see some change like what do you what do you recommend that that's something that people can do on a, on a small level? I mean, there there are a couple things. Uh, the greater effects, sadly, come down from the top from systemic policy changes within the government, which I think turns a lot of people off from it. You know, we're so overwhelmed with bullshit here, bullshit there. And I get it. I love to tune out too. And so it's very tough, but voting is the easiest way to do it. Local elections, you know, by the time this app comes out, it'll be passed. So hopefully you voted, but you know, these local municipal, uh, you know, within your County, those representatives that we elect into office have a big say in, in the way that, that we trend towards, you know, updating the grid to renewable energy, subsidizing, you know, electric vehicles, shit like that, not subsidizing big oil that like most politicians are like in their pockets. And I think that like, that's why most people get turned off from it. Like I do for Mm -hmm. sure. I feel hopeless. Yeah. I'm just like, ah, fuck. It's like, I don't trust the government is so like bought and sold that I'm like, I I personally feel hopeless in some senses. Dude, and it's easy to feel hopeless and like if especially if you're like diving into the news and like get anxiety and it's a it's a real thing because it is a serious thing, but like people don't like to talk about this because it is scary and serious and there is no easy solution to it. It is not black and white. Like it's a big gray area. And we're gonna have to make sacrifices, like maybe taxes will get higher for certain things, you know, and it is gonna be shit that people don't like in the short term, but you have to think about that longer term picture for your future children and your children's children and and the generations to come because like well you're gonna leave this place like a fucking dump like a toxic wasteland like what does that say (laughs) about you you know when you're 60 70 80 years old you're like oh i could have done something but i didn't want to vote you know we could have not gotten this guy in office and i think collectively you know at pow we call it the outdoor uh, the outdoor state, there's 50 million of us of people that like to snowboard, ski, climb, fish, hunt. It's all the same thing. And people that want to protect these places and like, we're all, we all have the same intentions. Like we want to see these places nice and we want to have clean air and, and fresh water for, for our kids to come. You know, it's a pretty simple thing when you break it down like that. And so, yeah, in terms of like actionable items, like, like voting, is like by far the easiest thing you can do. It takes two seconds. There's voting guides online. You get a voting guide with your mail-in ballot. Like it, you know, maybe takes a little bit of time out of your day. Um, Voting with your dollars is super important. You know, supporting the brands that have environmentally ethical standards on some level. Um, You know, and then just your day-to-day activity, you know, is, is, I would say, like probably lowest on total, like your personal carbon footprint but you know i think a lot of people think that um 
the change does come within for sure. But like back in the eighties, when these oil companies were like getting invested with Reagan and shit, like it was a very calculated misinformation campaign to uh, delegitimize the effects of climate change. You know, like those guys were having like full focus groups, like, like, okay, how can we like spin this so it doesn't seem as bad, right? And like, how can we create this doubt of climate change? And that's how it started from mm -hmm. the oil companies, you know, and like, not to say that Democrats aren't supported by big oil, like Republicans are, Democrats are, but like there are people that have good intentions and those people are running for office and it's up to us as individuals to figure out who those people are and support them. Good point. And another sidebar I think about a lot too is, uh, you know, the, the like renewable energy on the grid, I think is super important too. Cause it, you know, like it's kind of crazy with all the EVs, you have these electrical electric vehicles and that drive around and feel great and doing your part. But then also like the power that they're plugged into is oftentimes, uh, non, it, it non-renewable en energy. Right. So it's like, mm -hmm. If that switches and that's like obviously a, a, a significantly smaller carbon footprint, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to speak on this stuff because I'm not super well educated, but I think about that sometimes, you know. Totally. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, like lithium mining, I don't think is very good. But like I said, like there's no easy answer yep. to all this. And I don't think like I don't have the answers. I'm not pretending to have the answers. Yeah. I'm not pretending to be a scientist, you know. Yep. But like I said, like, how much you care is more important than how much you know, and you got to carry that with you. And so, long-winded answer to uh, the question there. Yeah, <laughs> but um, important I, topic. I, I would like to see you know more people in the snow space get involved. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was very eloquently stated, and I love the way you just did that. And and uh, it's such an interesting thing because we're in the the world of politics, right? And I think on this show. Oftentimes, I, I viewed it as, you know, especially during COVID when everything was so charged, mm -hmm. we, uh, you know, we kind of took the approach that like, maybe this is a break from politics. Let's just talk about snowboarding and be idiots, you know, and, and like escape from it. And because it is so polarizing, but I love the idea of people with different point of views and not saying I don't disagree with anything you just said, but just in general, people with diff different point of views being able to empathize and have conversations with each other. And, you know, like like certain things like, and, and I, I feel like together, you know, instead of like this, this like head on head, like, like, you know, me versus you, left versus right, everybody versus each other, like the, the real black belt move is, is like finding the similarities that you have with people with different point of views i think that's where a lot of real change happens and and um you know off air you know you mentioned like uh a point about scotty lago who's really big into hunting and i think that's a that's a good point to pick up from dude totally it can seem really polarizing especially post-covid yeah uh you know very blue versus red and whatever vax anti-vax the whole deal uh and it's so much easier to tune out of this whole thing and that's why i personally like to go into the mountains and be on airplane mode for multiple weeks at a time like it's a lot and um but when you realize like that we do have a lot more similarities than you would think like lego for example great friend he is a hunter he you know is like a supporter of the nra like things that i am like not into whatsoever like i don't eat meat i don't like guns. I'm very mechanically challenged. Uh, and then, you know, you have a conversation with him. I've known, we've known each other since we were like 12 years old. And he identifies as a conservationist. He wants to see the wildlands preserved. He doesn't want to see this big building development in his backyard. And I feel like hunters and fishermen and women, fisher people, uh, are like almost more in tune with the environment. You know, they know what the migration patterns are and, you know, based on the season and all of that. And like, those are people like, rather than butting up like red versus white, like 
dude, we want the same thing here, right? Like we want a better future for the generations to come. And so rather than just bickering and shutting the door on each other, I think like coming together and be like, oh yeah, okay, like let's both make some sacrifices here and like meet in the middle. Yeah, totally. And I think just from from a simple like human nature standpoint, is it like if you can get on the same team as somebody, like whatever all the other differences you have, what are those similarities? And you get on the same team, hey, this is what we got on common. Well, then, then you can, in common rather, that this is what that this is where progress I think happens because the the dividedness isn't isn't helping anybody. I think about that on a bigger social, socioeconomic, you know, the way we interact with other human beings and and uh, event. I I tend to have a, a sense of avoidance with with a lot of this stuff because of the polarizing effect. But I, I do like the con- the conversation around uh, what do we have in common. You know? No doubt, dude. And like I said before, <clears throat> 50 million people in the outdoor state, people that like to recreate outside. Mm-hmm. There are more of us than the fucking oil lobbyists out there. Like if we could all come together, we would be an unstoppable force. If like, so big oil just has like a handful of one percenters with a shit ton of money. So they're like throwing it at that. But like, man, th- like our elected representatives work for us. You know, if, if, if people spoke out and be like, hey, we're not down with this. We want you to invest in a clean grid. We want to see more electric buses in our towns. Uh, interesting thing, I kind of want to get your guys' take on the whole gondola debacle of well, the Cottonwood. Cottonwood. I know it's like up a, lot lately, a huh? heated topic. I was just curious if you guys like stand anywhere on that. I don't know enough about it. Personally. I mean, I've heard about it for so long, but mm-hmm. it just seems like there's never any real movement. Because um, it's, it's being heavily contested, yeah, you know, from environmental groups and whatnot. Because I mean, from what I know, not saying I like, I, I, I don't know enough about it, but like, I mean, it would kind of decimate certain areas up Little Cottonwood, and like, you guys have a pretty fucked up problem with traffic in the canyons, and so how do you deal with that? And it's gonna get worse, I imagine. Fuck yeah! Like, yeah. how many people moved to Salt Lake during COVID? They said like over a million. Is that the deal? Prices That's a went stat? Up on houses, yeah, it's got to be a wild name. Yeah, I mean, the world is changing very, very fast, like exponentially with more people coming into the world. And more people, too, like with COVID realizing that they don't want to live in, in whatever cities, you know, and they want to be close to the outdoors. I, I just think it's an interesting, uh, you know, stage in, like, the development of our country that we're going through. That, like, how do you deal with it? Mm-hmm. I'd like to For- see... Uh, I mean, they should just have people ride the bus more, maybe. Right, that like would a, alleviate like a the problem. Gaggle of buses going on twenty four seven. Yeah, that would be yeah. a good solution. To be totally frank with you, I don't, uh, I don't know enough about it to have an opinion on whether it's good or bad because I don't know the, obvi- the decimating of the population, unable to use some of these uh, recreating areas. But then the, the, the obviously the traffic going up and down the canyon, avoiding that it seems like a good thing. But personally, I just. You know, I'm not educated well enough to speak on it, so I don't. But I do like the the solution of incentivizing buses, or or just if there's a lot of them, you know, because those things are packed to the gills these days. So um, mm-hmm. if they if they had more of them, that seems like a great solution to a lot of this. I also think uh, they had talked at one point about trying to figure out a system where you could access like all mountains from one. Like go up Brighton and gondola be able to get, that gets you from big to little. Yeah, it's too know. bad they had. I don't agree with that. Yeah. They didn't put in a I'm train system or something way early that would have helped out, like you see in Europe some places. But didn't Disney want to put a uh, roller coaster on Mount Superior back in the day? <laughs> oh jeez, I never heard that. I didn't know that. <laughs> That'd be crazy. I heard that. Yeah. Wow. Wild. Yeah. All right, we're gonna get into a guest question. Uh, this is from friend of the show, Michelle Parker. Here we go. What up, East Stone and Chris, my two favorite podcast hosts, and Nick Russell. I couldn't be more excited to listen to this episode and psyched that you're in the booth today. Um, first off, I got to say your passion and drive to be in the mountains, making memories with friends and sharing turns is some of the best and it's contagious. Thank you for that. Additionally, you've always treated me like an equal in the mountains, which is very much appreciated as a female in this industry that likes to go big in the bigger mountains. My question today for you is kind of a tougher one, but it's something I've been dealing with myself. I always find myself a little bit confused when this happens, but after losing friends in the mountains or people that we admire and have learned from who have set the boot pack for us to move forward, 
How do you deal with that on a personal level? Does it change your risk tolerance or your approach to the mountains or your desire to be out there? Um, yeah, I just kind of want to gain some insight from you because I know we're going through this one together and I got a ton of love for you. And yeah, thank you for doing what you do. All of y'all make the mountains a better place. Much appreciated. Thanks, Michelle. Appreciate the question. Uh, <clears throat> heavy question for sure. She's referring to the loss of Hillary Nelson, who just passed away on Monoslu, uh, 8,000 meter peak in Nepal a couple of weeks ago when I was out there. I was trying to ride a, a nearby peak. Um, she was up there with Jim Morrison, her partner, and got caught in a small avalanche skiing off the summit. And uh, I was carried down the other side of the mountain and passed away, sadly. Um, and it was f still as fucking heavy, dude. Like, you lose friends and... It's gnarly. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm pretty fresh from this trip. Like, I've been back less than two weeks. Um, so I'm still unpacking my personal experience out there. But, I mean, for, like, the listeners of, like, why this was so hard-hitting and close for me, um, Jim and Hillary, Jim Morrison and Hillary are kind of two people that I've looked up to for a very long time and have sort of set the bar for high altitude, big mountain exploration. And, you know, first descent of Lhotse, the fourth highest peak in the world, Papsura, peak of evil in India, she did Everest and Lhotse in the same day, other 8,000 meter peaks, and she just really paved the way for not only females in the space, but for everyone, for me included. And that's what drew me to Nepal. And, you know, we arrived in the Kathmandu the same day. We did our tour of the monkey temples that same day. We went to the Bogmati River and watched these cremation ceremonies along the river. And that was really fucking heavy to see. Um... But so they went off on their mission to their peak. We went to ours, and we were texting via inReach the whole time, you know, checking in on each other's progress. We had very difficult weather where we were, uh, so we weren't able to make much progress in the beginning. And then we eventually started to make a little bit of progress on the mountain. And texting with Hillary real time, they got turned around from camp three and skied down and were pretty beat down. And she asked me that they were going to go back up to go try to get the summit and ski off it. So that was the last text that I got. She's like, we skied down from camp three and it was so much fun that we're going to go try again. And we, my, me and my team, Blake, Gordon, it was just two of us at this point. Dan Korn was with us. And uh, we were packing up to go make a summit push. Um, we already had gear cached on the mountain. And, you know, m uh, my buddy Mikey Arnold comes over. He was on another uh, expedition team. He's a North Face athlete. Comes running over. He's like, hey, I heard, I heard Hillary was pushing to crevasse. And that's, like, all he heard. He just got when, – when you're out in the mountains, you're getting in-reach texts. So you're, you're only getting texts. And, you know, information is pretty broken. You know, you don't know what the real story is. Uh, got on the satellite phone, called Jibon, our kind of logistics coordinator, uh, who was also working with Jim and Hill. Confirmed that she took a fall. And um, they were getting ready to do a helicopter rescue. Uh, the next day, but everything like that takes time. It's high altitude. You're at the tallest mountains in the world. These are all 8,000 meter peaks. They're all over 26,000 feet. So everything is like exponentially, logistically challenging to do out there. And we were at a standstill at base camp. 
kind of waiting for the news. But you know, deep down, like you spend a night out above 8,000 meters, like there's not really any chance for survival, you know? And uh, so it was heavy, like being in shock, definitely the first couple of days, like the reason I'm there is because of this woman and like her inspiration and like they were supposed to come to Dalagiri to the mountain that we were at after they were going to ski their peak which was like technically like an easier peak and they were going to heli over to our peak and climb with us because they had already been acclimatized <coughs> so I was like gonna get to fucking climb and ride 8,000 meter peak with like two of my heroes and then the hero gets taken out like what do you do in there, you know? And, like, there's high risk on these mountains. And, like, knew that going into it. Um, I was ready to take a bigger risk, like, going into this mountain, just, like, the inherent nature of these higher mountains. And then this happened, and, like, you know, there was this other French woman that we became friends with who was, like, you know, like, no, oh, you I was like, we were going to go up today and get our shit, but can't go. And she's like, no, your legs are cut off. Like, you know, I'm like, yeah, like I, I, I can't fucking move. Like, I don't want to go up this mountain right now. And yeah, we had to go up and get our shit and kind of decided that maybe like two days, three days on the mountain would, you know, help clear my head, go experience a bit of the higher mountain, had kind of ruled out making a summit push at this point. And, um, basically just get up on the mountain and like I didn't want to be there anymore like I'm walking under huge seracs and I'm stepping over crevasses and shit that you have to want to do that in order for it to happen like when you don't want to be in the mountains everything is harder like you feel the altitude more your backpack is heavier and like that the hard aspects of it, like, really, you know, kind of amplify themselves. And I just, like, didn't fucking want to be on the mountain anymore. I'm like, I don't want to step across this bottomless crevasse. This is not worth it right now. And we bailed, ended up going to ceremony that they did in Kathmandu. And... We get there and fresh off the mountain, like noted we were, you know, on the mountain for a month at this point. So completely immersed. And every time, like I said, coming back into the the world is, is a bit of a culture shock. And we went straight to her cremation ceremony. Um, and the last time I had seen her, we were seeing other bodies be cremated like on the Bhagavad River, and this is very spiritual aspect or like phase of life that those ceremonies go through. And um, it was just fucking heavy, dude. Like I don't even know how to explain it, but I do think being in Nepal with Jim, with this crew that was close to her, it personally helped me because in in that side of the world, um, death is a lot more accepted and part of everyday life. That it's something in the Western world that we maybe uh, avoid. You know, we don't like talking about death and grief. And it's very hard to deal with that kind of stuff. And we pretend like we're invincible and, you know, don't think that, you know, our, our friends or loved ones are ever going to pass away. But like, that's the only constant that we have in life that all of us have in common. We're all born and we all die. And so being in that setting, I think ultimately did help me and being around some people that have dealt with that, like Jimmy Chan and Conrad Anchor, who have dealt with the loss of close friends in the mountains was, uh, comforting thing for me but it's 
it's a hard thing to comprehend of like why we do what we do. You know, we know that the risks are out there and you can't go into the mountains thinking that you're immune to them. And you have to be well aware of them, but you can't be petrified of them. You can't let that stop you from, you know, doing doing big things in life, whatever it may be. You can't let these fears control you. And, you know, like I said, it's still unpacking it all and like just kind of one of those things that comes with the territory. And I think people do, you know, deal with it differently. Um, but having this greater community, like mountain community, has like been for sure the most comforting thing for all of us, for Michelle, for myself, for everyone that, that Hillary touched who, you know, her reach spans thousands or millions of humans around the world, you know. She was a fucking superhuman. She should probably get a super, super air horn for her. Yeah, let's give her everything we got here. Yeah, blow up pipes. <laughs> um, the bomb hole salute. Yeah, thank you. But, I mean, there's just no way around it. It just fucking sucks, dude. And, like, I've I, I've lost friends in the mountains, and it's makes you rethink what you're doing, you know, at times. And the best we can do is, like, try to be as calculated as possible and be open to the signs that are being presented from the skies above. Like, does this feel right? Listen to your gut. Like, if something doesn't feel right, bail. No one cares, you know? Like, there's never any pressure from anybody to do anything in the mountains. Everyone thinks what you're doing is crazy anyways. <laughs> like, like you had to, like, beg your sponsors to, to help you get to these places. Like, they don't care if you do these things. And if they do, like, I would quit, you know? Like, I think that's the good thing about, like, what we do is, like, it's stepping beyond this kind of traditional realm. And yeah, man, it's it's just like a heavy hitting topic that that you have to deal with. So, fuck, man, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry for your loss. Thank you. Interesting to hear what you were saying about how the culture over there is more accepting. Yeah, yeah, totally. Because I mean, because it like, is. We all, everyone's gonna go there. Yeah, I think like with Buddhism and Hindu. Um, that it is just more like a part of life, yeah. you know, and you celebrate life yeah. in that sense. And yeah, you're going to mourn. You're going to cry. Grief hits you in fucked up ways. Yeah. <laughs> when I was climbing back up the mountain to get my gear, I'm like breaking out crying. It like, hits you. Yeah, it just hits you when you're like, don't <laughs> expect it, you know. Um, and you need that too, I think, There's, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 And you have to let it out from time to time. Like you can't remain in that same state of shock and denial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the denial is the real suffering. I think the denial of it, the denial of it happening or the, what really that is, is lack of acceptance, uh, is the, is really t torturous. And, and then the acceptance may turn in grief's got different forms of anger. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I think it's okay to just identify like if you're, you're like, you know, losing loved ones, if, Okay, I'm sad. I'm crying. Why? I'm, I'm sad because I miss my friend. I'm sad because it's weird that this person that I used to talk to is just not there. Like that's fucking sad, dude. Like and that's okay, you know. It's okay to be sad. I love this like quote. Maybe Mark Twain. Like, you know, all of us along the lines of like all of us die, but do we all really live? And you know, she was the testament of that pushing, pushing these boundaries and like laying the groundwork for countless people, people like myself to come in and, and get inspiration from. And, you know, you I, like you just need a break sometimes from it all. Like, I don't really want to be in the mountains right now. Um and maybe just want to go and do some 
not dangerous things. It's, it's this interesting thing. It's like, how do you live every day like it's your last, but not kill yourself doing it? It's, um, it's like a very fine line. We live in this gray area in the big mountains where nothing is 100%. You know, nothing is ever fully safe. And we're all aware of the risks that you take. And it's just like, yeah, how do you move move forward from that is up to you. The risk factor is just exponential out there, huh? For sure. And I mean, it doesn't have to be in the Himalaya. Like, Greg Weaver got in a huge avalanche in Tahoe on a moderate hazard day. Yeah. You know? It no, happen anywhere. No red flags, and it can happen. And it, it comes down to a numbers game. It's all how much time you spent you spend in these environments it's like it, it, it's an odds game you know yeah, if you're out there you can every go day. And, you can go and get away with something 9999 times for that thousandth time that balance is going to catch up to you yeah it's That's it's like the surfing that. you know there's like i've heard a quote of like where it's like well if i never go surfing i never have to worry about getting bit by a shark hmm. but it's like but then you fucking never go then surfing. Then you never went surfing or go right. surfing. It's All ships are safe at at harbor. At harbor. <laughs> that's not what ships are made for. Yeah. You know, yeah. you're made to go through the waves. You're mm-hmm. made to endure some hard times. And like, you got to experience these highs and lows. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, hopefully you don't. But Well, then the times that you're really living life to the fullest, you're oftentimes closer to death you're right? walking Un- that line unfortunately and um but death can happen dude death can happen from disease death can happen from getting hit by a car um and totally uh but death is a part of life i think that's a really important uh thing you said earlier yeah i just yeah talking about it and you know i mean talking about this helping me a lot and yeah talking helps for sure get, you have to i think that's there. when you get some like Deep rooted issues going on, yeah. no matter what it is. Yep. You know, you have to talk about shit. Talk it so. out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's always interesting, you know, the person that passed is not sad, you know, they've moved on. They've moved on. Yeah. For sure. They're on the next stage. And, and we're left here to mourn. And so you just got to take that and just try to get through it the best mm-hmm. you can. Yeah. And it was an interesting thing being out there, like saying earlier, how I was like ready to take a pretty big risk going out there. And then after that happened, feeling that collective energy of pain and grief. A little moment of silence for the crew. Yeah, thank you. You know, it is cool. I When we were in Kathmandu together, I got like peddled by this street vendor and, and bought this necklace when I was with her and like wasn't sure on it. And then, you know, now that everything that's happened, I'm super psyched. On yeah. It. Now it's like this, yeah. something yeah. that's super important to you. Totally. Yeah. Nice memento. Crazy yeah. how that, that mm-hmm. works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I personally believe that the, the <laughs> just isn't intended to help and it's grief is tough. And, uh, but I personally believe that the ones that pass on are with us all the time. So I think that that kind of at least brings me peace. And I don't want to sound preachy and whatever, I agree. But, but it's yeah. brought me comfort. And me too. And I love the the. Uh, I actually, I'll, I'll fucking talk about this. I don't know if I ever talked about this on air, but I had a close friend, Simon, pass away, and uh, I connected with a medium. <clears throat> a medium is somebody that can you know talk to spirits and whatnot. And uh, and obviously this probably going to turn a lot of people off you know they're like you know not into that which is awesome totally fine uh but for me it was something i found a lot of comfort in and I, when i connected with my friend simon she, the medium channeled through her and she changed her voice and she's like right into what simon would say and he was still a fucking wise ass and he's just like hey i'm with you all the time buddy like fucking dude i'm with you so that that's that's gone on to bring me like like, like, um, you know, some, some weird inner peace. Um, so I don't know. I'll I, just leave that there. I believe it. 
Appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, totally. Um, okay, well, man, for the greater community, mourning her loss, uh, everybody, man, it's we're all in this together, and uh, hopefully the community can move through it. And um, yeah. So, uh, did that make you? Is that I know you're still processing. Do you think it's going to make you turn the volume down, or or do you think you're going to to still keep going, or where you at with all that stuff? I mean, it's a weird. <laughs> life drive that we have where you know strangely want to go back to nepal and like hard thing to justify mm-hmm. you know um but it'll all take time cool uh another thing i wanted to top uh topic i wanted to cover because you know we've been going for a while and i only got a couple of li- things left on this list but i know you have a cabin in the south sierras uh what's up with this cabin and, and what's your plan and what's the deal with it yeah, got a cabin is a generous term for it. It is a cabin for sure, but like probably about the size of this room here. Um, off grid, 10,000 feet in the high Sierra, a little community up there. And, you know, you need to either walk or, or take a snowmobile in in the, in the wintertime. And right at the base of some really, really great terrain for riding. Uh, essentially, not, not a big piece of land or anything. There's, you know, you can see neighbors' cabins and whatnot, but not too many people go up there in the wintertime. And it's essentially borders wilderness, so uh, not a sled zone. And it is just pretty limitless out there. It's pretty close to Yosemite, the northern boundary there, and has a lot of potential. Like, you know, we've had two shitty winters in a row, so hoping that this year it turns on and can spend some more time there and really explore Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jeremy was saying you guys spent a lot of time in the in the Sierras, just kind of exploring your backyard. There's just a lot, a lot of cool stuff in in uh, driving distance of where you guys live. Yeah, like you know, we've had a lot of emphasis on these remote expeditions to the far corners of the world, but really, like it, it's the hidden nooks in your backyard that are most exciting to me, man. Like the Eastern Sierra, High Sierra, is you know, relatively unexplored. It's hard to access and rugged terrain. And when the winters are on, dude, there's nowhere else I'd rather be. Like, I'll gladly stay there from January through May, no problem, if we're having a good snow year. And that's what's cool about, uh, you know, splitboarding is, like, you don't need to go to Nepal to have this wild experience. You can drive an hour from your house and go get somewhere where no human has ever been. It's pretty fucking cool. That is way cool. rad. Love that. Uh, Buds, I think it might be time to get into the pub beer crapshoot. Um, you going to crack a can? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to crack this can. Ooh. Forgot to upload the theme music. Crackety, crackety, crack. How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> the pub beer crapshoot. So, uh, yeah, I'm cracking this pub beer. It's crackety, delicious. crackety, crackety, crackety. <laughs> yeah. It's cheap. It's fun. It's delicious. I'm going to drink one today, but you might catch me drinking uh, maybe 10 on a weekend. Let's go. They're going down easy. Yeah, yeah he's been casually sipping them over there. Mm-hmm. They support the show. If you want to get a good beer, support pub beer. Uh, okay. Uh, you got to roll the dice that are in front of you. Okay. And we'll tell you what you got Goon Gear's a six. Shout out to Goon Gear. Dude, I feel like that Goon Gear always hits. Goon Gear. Seven. Has it weighted? Seven. <laughs> it always goes to seven. Seven's like the Dude, n- I'm thinking these dice are weighted. But, Lucas. But Lucas I, like, I like seven. Who's one of your favorite people to party with? That's a good one. That's a good one. That is a good one. I got to say, my man, Dan. Dan's Traveling Dan Davis. You know, when he's on the rails, we call him Steely Dan. Steely Dan. Steely Dan. I like to call him Sacrificial Dan, because <laughs> back when we were living together, he would uh, he would always leave for a contest, and it would start snowing. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Sacrificial Dan. Maybe the best impersonator in the biz as yeah, well. He really is good. For sure, dude. Yeah. I've had a lot of, lot of good times partying with Dan. Yeah. Yeah, so much so that your like stomach hurts from laughing when he's when he's on <laughs> yeah, a good he's one. Such a funny dude. It's a little liquor in him. He gets real funny. Dude, like the past two years, he had just got married. Now he's, I don't know if, yeah, he, he's gonna have a kid by the time this comes out. Um, but so I've been to so many events celebrating Dan that like, if we have a reason to celebrate and party, you know, we like to party, but. 
Dan is definitely the the focal point of any room, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Great party. He's well, good at it. It's time for uh, hot takes. We're going to get into hot takes, a uh, staple of the show. Mm-hmm. We like to start it off with the, you know, the Michael Jordan and or greatest of all time to you, as it pertains to you in snowboarding, uh, both male and female. Um, you know, I would say that I do have an answer, um, but I have a couple... Uh, Honorable mentions, if that's okay. He's going to Louis Vito us. No, yeah, no, no. Is. I have an answer. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Honorable yeah. mentions okay. is then all right, basically let's, all right, let's hit the honorable mentions. Let's <laughs> yeah, get right. those out of the so way. So if the analogy is MJ to basketball, <laughs> yep. uh, Craig Kelly is, I think, like a beyond the question. Yep. Craig is the ball. Craig's right? the ball. Oh, wow. Be I the ball. This yeah, answer. be the ball. So Craig's like, yeah, he, he's above this. Um, when I was growing up, watching the movies – Obsessing over the movies. Uh, Stand Deliver Detective KJ, Kevin Jones, was a absolute god. Stout. Still is a god. And, uh, you know, now that he's a super close friend, it's super fucking cool. Um, so I was like, kind of when I was growing up. And a um, couple honorable. We're going Man. seasons of Man. your life. No, 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 no. <laughs> we're we're gonna expedite it. But like you know, the Terrier, the Rice, uh, in terms of like pure, pure snowboard talents. Uh, but like full goat of people that have contributed to snowboarding, their talent on a board. I gotta say, Jeremy Jones. Wow, Jib, obviously, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Big Mountain. Tahoe. We, Jeremy Jones. I, I, don't Tahoe Jones. I don't know if we've gotten that one, and We're I like go it. Tahoe Jones on? I like it. I like that, too. Yeah, I mean, he, like I said, he literally wrote the book on this shit. Yeah. And is is the doctor. So. The MJJ, Dr. Well, Jones. he's had yeah. a really long, great um, career. In also snowboard. from Massachusetts, yeah. so he's got that going Dude, for him. He's been doing it for a been long time. Been doing it a long time. time. Yeah, yeah, and he's still, every time we go out, you're watching him. You know, you're like, damn, that was a sick toe side turn and when you go out filming with him too like he's done it for so long that he knows knows how to ride the mountain he knows how to ride his board and it always doing. looks good he doesn't fuck up i've never seen him fuck up i've the, never seen him fall to be honest <laughs> surviving those spicy spine lines yeah. dude, you kind of forget like how rowdy he how was gnarly that for is. a long dude, time on the edge yeah okay female who you got female i gotta say like former uh victoria and or like whatever your category, and then like present goat Elena Height. Wow, great answer. Yeah, like having the opportunity to shred with her, like she's coming to her own the past couple of years, and she's just a little ninja out there, dude. Like her part this year in Arc is my favorite part in the movie. Uh, just full hard charging Valdez free ride. Arc is a project kind of Danny Davis uh, headed up this year with. Uh, Nick's got a heater part in it. Checked it out. So that'll be out by the time this is out. Okay. Uh, next one. Most underrated. Who you got? I got to There's a lot of underrated people, but I got to say Neil and Ian Provo. Wow. I love that answer. Provo Some bros. Fucking dark horses yeah. that don't get the support that they should. I think if any of their sponsors are listening, you guys should pony up. Yeah, pony up, guys. Let's get a little pony up going. Come yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> pony up. Okay, steel or powder? I'm thinking he's going to say steel. I think steel, too. Stupid question. Steel. Please say steel. Just say steel. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, best style ever. Uh, Craig Kelly on the ground, Danny D in the air. Ooh, ground and air. Ground and air. I Good. like yeah. that. Best video ever made. Aaron Robinson's Manifest. Have you guys seen it? Yes. Sam Tour. Like low key, like that video didn't get the shine it no. deserves, you know. Uh, but if A Rob was still with us, dude, he would be fucking front and center right there. I don't even who knows where he would be. True. Pretty incredible film. Yeah, that's like, a fact right there. DIY style, just pure juice. Mm-hmm. Sam we'll Tour. Sure very, in the show notes. very underrated yeah, very uh, filmer as well. He he uh, filmed the warp wave movies for like the year that I was working with them and mm. He's just low key silent killer. Yeah, talented dude. Okay, uh, best board graphic ever made. 
Danny always has some good ones. Um, but I gotta say the sword. Terrier. It's a great, very great sought one. after board. Good graphic. It's like classic and clean. Yep. Okay, if you could go heli boarding with three people, just good time. I guess this maybe it doesn't pertain to you because you're not that into it. No, dude, I'm going climb like, boarding, dude. Yeah. Free trip? Yeah. On the bomb hole? Yeah, yeah. I feel yeah, like yeah, free on the bomb hole. It's an expensive trip. How about this yeah. though? How about this? This this thing fucking is battery powered too. We'll just we'll add it. We'll add that little rechargeable. It's a, it's battery powered, so fuck okay. it. You just plug it in. You at plug night. this thing in. It's like a Tesla. Cool. You're, you're I going? I got two ships. That's probably against the rules, but I got a. Uh, spirit ship of Craig, Jake, and Salaz. Three people I never had the chance of hanging with. And then the other ship would be my man KJ, because he invited me on his, Wyatt Stasinos. And man, the third, I would say my brother Joshua, because he was the one that got me hooked. Solid. You know he's on Red Bull though. He can burn some buds. They got yeah. they got they got buds. They can get make two that ships. happen. They can get two expensive ships. to Chris. Yeah. yeah, just send it to the bomb hole. Just uh, we'll get a check in the mail. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, we talk about the beaver slap on this show. Um, you know when you're in the lift line, you got snow in your top sheet. A lot, a lot of times you'll see that alpha male in the lift line just aggressively smack tail. What's your take on the beaver slap? I I like to keep a little bit of snow on the on the nose so of like you know you're thirsty and you don't have a water bottle. Um, but I back it, like get the, get the snow off your tail and off the middle for sure. You also, there's kind of a split board slap that you yeah. got to do when it gets on the, on the top of the, the, the skis. Dueling. You know, it's funny. Like I kind of am paranoid about breaking a binding strap, so I don't go full aggressive mm. slap, but more of like a, a little sweep. Mm-hmm. You're obviously not riding those union bindings. <laughs> 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 oh, nice one. Buds. Wow. Nice little zing. Okay. Uh, next Last question, worst trend. Hmm. Worst trend, I would have to say the, uh, like, TikTok-style uh, Instagram you see these days. You see a lot of fucking, you know, these, like, same song remixes that come out, and uh, they're on, like, thousands of videos, and people put them over their shredding videos, and I just don't get it, man. I like... They're doing it to try to get more views. It's all alg- algorithm. I just, it's kind of... It's whack. Yeah, no, totally. But, like, Use I see song. dudes that don't yeah. need to do that doing it. Yeah. And it's... it's crazy. Like, yeah, it's just whack, dude. Like, the whole thing with, with the gram and everything is, like, you know, where I was like, oh, we need to do it for our job and whatnot. And, like, that's become the standard. And the only reason it's become the standard is because everybody's fucking doing it. Like, if none of us gave in to it, like, it wouldn't be a trend. So I There's could, always that one dude that's going to give in, though, and ruin it for everybody. Yeah. One dude or a chick. Totally. But yeah, that stuff kind of grinds my gears. Great answers. Great uh, answers. Okay. And, and uh, you know, we got to talk setups. But before we do... I don't think you clarified what exactly your role is over at Wonder. I uh, <laughs> I don't even know. I like to call myself the chief chief slope technician. Um, CST. CST for short. Um, CST. But rider and makes then makes a lot of sense now. <laughs> <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. These, these guys are fucking CST. Yeah, it CST, all makes that's sense. That's all you now. had to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Should have said that at the beginning. We would have cleared things up. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm primarily dealing with product testing and kind of developing boards and whatnot. So, um, you know, a lot of product feedback and things like that. And kind of, you know, getting my hands in the pot as much as I can, as much as I'm online and in the mix. So getting, he's, a, he's a CST. Yeah, he's a CST, okay. getting his hands on pot. Yeah, he's, easy. He's touching pots. That Lobby. really, yeah, yeah. that really cleared everything up. So yeah. often as he can. Because you're wondering, I don't yeah. like to have titles, dude. <laughs> Puts you in don't, a box. Don't put yeah, me in a don't box. Don't put him in a box. Don't, don't box this guy in. Yeah. Don't box him up. Uh, okay, so talking about your setup, uh, you know, run us through. You know, I didn't bring the full board out here, but on the Wonder Alpine Bell Tour behind me, uh, generally on 156, 159, come springtime. Uh, Spark splitboard bindings, ride the Arc Pro. Um, been running 
32 boots the past couple of years. Cook's been hooking it up. I uh, ride the Jones TM2. Shout out, Cook. Thank you. Great boot. I'd get on the, the Grenier love. Team 3 if it was me, but, you I'd know, whatever you got to do. Dude, Stay yeah. on that Jones. Yeah. I should get on that. I should try it out. Um, Patagonia outerwear and everything. It's uh, best gear out there, most environmentally friendly there is. And on goggles and on helmet with the bull wrap. Arcade belts. And uh, I think that was about it. Killer. We, we actually, speaking of Patagonia, we have a print of him that Andrew Miller shot that was on the cover of Patagonia. It's going to be signed and available on bombhole.com. Awesome shot. Could be on your wall. You could yeah. be watching him surf the earth. Yeah, yeah thank you, talk Andrew, about a, for providing that. Yeah, talk well, about a dope-looking turn. Good-ass photog. Uh, questions, too, about setting up your split board. I, I know our listeners love to know a little, like, gear hacks. Do you do anything, like, funky when you set it up or just take it out of the plastic, throw the bindings on and go? Do you tune tip and tail? Uh, you don't want those catching on any firm snow. Um, but I like razor-sharp edges, for sure. Um, stance is, uh, I would probably ride a bit of narrower stance than most and probably more angle than most. Posi posi. I'm probably like 20. These like certain bindings, you know, goes in threes and you never really know. Right. So like around 2021 20, in the front, posi three to six in the back. Um, that's how you get that sick looking turn going, huh? That posy surf posy. Surfing the news. Yeah. And then like a little skinnier. Yeah. So you go elbow to fist and like a little, like maybe that's like. That's your stance? Yeah. Yeah. And like a, like an inch or a little that's bit of wiggle about. room so after question. that. Elbow to about, fist right? in between the bindings. In between the yeah, bindings. So correct. Once the set, bindings are set up. Yeah. Got elbow it. to fist with yep. a little bit. With it's a little. 21 right there. Bit. And I feel like that's, um, you know, relatable for every size person based on how. Huh. Big your arms. Unless you're Rajon Rondo. Arm. He's got a wingspan of somebody that's like, he's 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 a basketball saw. player. But anyway, sorry, continue. But yeah, that's kind of the uh, the go-to setup. I think a lot of people get really overwhelmed with like setting up split board bindings because mm-hmm. it can like, there's a lot of screws at times and like there's kind of a lot going on. The first time you do it, it might take you like an hour to set it up. And then every other time you do it, it's going to take you 10 minutes or less, you know. Um, keep a, keep a fre- fresh wax in the springtime. Mostly spring. Winter, like, I'm not too on it, you know, but springtime, your base gets dried out uh, a lot faster. Like, the snow is a lot more coarse, so it's, like, taking a bit more of a toll. But, but yeah, having that that fresh wax. And then I always find it interesting, like, with a split board, it's really hard to keep a maintained wax board with, you know, pulling skins on and off. So you got to stay on it. You gotta watch the gloop in the spring. The gloop is the fucking worst. Gloop, man, There's no way to get rid gloop. of it once it starts, too. Yeah, the gloop. Funny gloop. story of Ian Walsh when we were on Denals. Uh, Denals. He, he got to the summit and had his skins on. He stayed in uh, like split board mode the whole climb. So his skins were on just like baking in the sun. And oh, no. Get to the top and he pulls his skins off and he tries to drop in and just like you know, kind of Tito's. It's like low angle. It's pretty chill off the top, but just like can't move and pulls his board over and looks and it's just caked in glue and there's nothing you can do about it at this point. And you can use a scraper the best you can. And we were already off the mountain. We were back at camp and he said that he had a a stove in his backpack and he was ready to like puncture the, the fuel canister with his ice ax to and light it on fire. <laughs> to like like melt it off. Burn it off, dude. It's like 10 p.m., 20,000 feet. <laughs> and he's trying to like almost explode a propane canister. You can't keep that thing facing the sun, huh? No, that's pretty It's crucial. like a surfboard. Yeah, totally. Uh, random pro tip, tip. I do with my split board bindings, since I've, I, whenever I switch over, sometimes I forget like which way the ankle straps go, like because mm-hmm. it's kind of confusing. So I cut out like an R and an L from my sticker packs from brands that have like the letters R or L. Smart. And I put an R on my right one and an L on my left one. So when I'm switching over my split board, I'm like, all right, because I fucked up so many times. So that's uh, maybe a little pro tip. I don't know. That could be a pro tip for sure. Like doing a little paint pan action. Yeah. You can you know, because I mean, it's a it's an easy mistake to make. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. Okay, uh, you know, lastly, I guess we got to get into is uh, thank yous. There's 
definitely a long list of friends, mentors, sponsors over the years. Probably too many to list, but um, if I could go off the top of my head, my parents, Amy and Scott, my brother Joshua, Danny D, the Matrani family, my girlfriend Rachel, Jeremy Jones, Jim Zellers, Alex Pashley, Andrew Miller, Forrest Shear, the Provos, uh, you know, Clark and Murph. There's going to be too many I'm going to forget. Uh, That's the problem. You list too yeah, many. Yeah, you're you're kind of digging yourself yeah, into a hole with that. There's some people right like now. saying, please say my name. Please say my name. I know. <laughs> yeah. I love you. Like, what about Ming Poon? He's... I love you. Thank you, Ming. Thank yeah. you, Michelle, Elena, Hooper, the whole crew, all the sponsors, Wonder Alpine, Patagonia. Red Bull, Spark, On X Backcountry, and on Arcade Belts. Um, yeah, man, there's a lot of people. I think like we owe all of us owe a lot to the people that came before us, and none of us would be here without the help from from our friends and, and the people that support us. So thank you. Awesome. Uh, and one other thing too. Any projects coming out to plug? Um, Things like that. Yeah, we are dropping ARC. Uh, Danny's kind of produced new action flick coming out probably by the time this drops. Uh, also a additional movie with that radical sabbatical that's going to include a lot of, uh, you know, kind of B angles, excess footy, that kind of stuff. We got a trip with John Jackson in Alaska with Red Bull, Dorito Safari coming out at some point. I, I don't know when. Um, we got the Wonder Alpine Hardwired short film project coming out here soon. Uh, Cody Townsend 50 project up in Alaska. And yeah, I think that's about it. Killer. Lots of, lots of good stuff to check out. All those links will be in the show notes uh, if you're listening to this. And um, I kind of want to leave people with the quote we asked you in the Patreon interview of maybe best advice or words to live by. You had a great answer. Yeah, I think just keep in mind that nothing in the future has ever happened yet. So don't, don't stress the little things, you know. Pet the sweaty. Don't sweat the petty. Pet the sweaty. Don't say it one more time. <laughs> Pet, don't sweat the petty. Pet the sweaty. Like it. Grab tail checks in the mail. Okay. Yes. Love it. Well, it's uh, been a great podcast, Nick. We really appreciate everything you're doing. Uh, really appreciate having you come on the show. Um, and I thank just you guys. Say thank you. Yeah. Huge fan of the show. So honored to be sitting in the seat. Thank you. Killer. And lastly, obviously, thank you to everybody that tunes into our show and supports us and this whole uh, snowboard community. We love you guys. And, uh, over and out from the bomb hole.